Ready? This hearing will come to order. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm, I've been told the uh, director is uh, running a little late, so we'll get started uh, without her. Um, again, I'd like to welcome all of our witnesses. I, I appreciate the time you've put into uh, preparing your testimony. It's uh, uh, very informative of uh, this very serious issue. Because earlier this month, the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, announced that over the last year, hackers stole 4.1 million federal employees' personal records. Then, just days later, we learned the attack was actually far broader, involving some of the most sensitive data the federal government holds on its employees and likely many more records. It is hard to overstate the seriousness of this breach. It has put people's lives and our nation at risk. This massive theft of data may be the largest breach the federal government has seen to date. But, that's not the, but it's not the first data breach affecting federal agencies or even OPM. Unfortunately, I doubt it will be the last. Our nation is dependent on cyber infrastructure, and that makes our future vulnerable. The cyber threats against us are going to continue to grow in size and sophistication. The purpose of this hearing is to lay out the reality of that cyber threat and vulnerability. The first step in solving any problem is recognizing and admitting you have one. We must acknowledge we have a significant cybersecurity problem in the federal government, especially at OPM. This intrusion on OPM networks is only the latest of many against the agency, and OPM has become a case study in the consequences of inadequate action and neglect. Cybersecurity on federal agency networks has proven to be grossly inadequate. Foreign actors, cyber criminals, and hacktivists are accessing our net networks with ease and impunity. While our defenses are antiquated, by comparison, our, our adversaries are proving to be highly sophisticated. Meanwhile, agencies are concentrating their resources trying to dictate cybersecurity requirements for private companies, which in many cases are implementing cybersecurity better and cheaper. OPM has been hacked five times in the last three years and has still not responded to effectively secure its network. Today's, hearings will focus, today's hearing will focus on the two most recent breaches. We will hear from the OPM Inspector General, Mr. Patrick McFarland, that OPM has continued to neglect information security which may have contributed to these breaches. We will hear from Dr. Andy Osment about the specifics of this attack, as well as the Department of Homeland Security's role in federal cybersecurity. Mr. Tony Scott will testify about efforts on cybersecurity across the government and the information security requirements of federal agencies. Finally, we will give OPM Director Catherine Archuleta an opportunity to explain how this happened on her watch to let us know who she believes is responsible and to clarify what we can expect from OPM going forward. There's a bullseye on the back of USA.gov, and it does not appear this administration is devoting enough attention to this reality. We need leadership to develop and implement an effective plan to stop future cyber attacks. Without effective cybersecurity, our nation will not be safe or secure. Cybersecurity must be a top priority. So I think, again, I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, welcome everybody here to the hearing room. I, I look forward to the testimony. And with that, I'll turn it over to our ranking member, Senator Carper. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks uh, for holding this hearing, and uh, welcome to all of our witnesses. We appreciate your being here and appreciate your service to our country. A few weeks ago, uh, we all know we learned of a massive data breach at the Office of Personal Management. Personal and financial information for more than four million current and former federal employees may have been compromised. And if that's not bad enough, uh, reports now indicate that background investigation information, some of the most sensitive personal information the federal government holds, may have also been compromised, potentially touching millions of additional lives. This attack is deeply troubling and could have far-reaching consequences for a great number of people. It could have a profound impact on our national security as well. Understandably, the public and my colleagues are upset and they are frustrated. They want answers, and so do I, and so does this committee. Before we leave here today, I want us to learn the answers to at least four questions. First, what went wrong? Second, what are we doing about it? Third, what more needs to be done? And fourth, how can we help the legislative branch, the House and the Senate? Ultimately, sustained corrective action will be needed before we restore the public's confidence in our government's ability to keep their personal information safe and secure. 
I was encouraged to hear that OMB recently launched a 30-day cyber security sprint to further protect federal systems from cyber attacks. That's a good start, but I think we all agree it's not enough. As we can see from OMB's most recent annual report card on federal network security, I think we have a table. Uh, should be a, there should be a table on uh, everybody's uh, desk. I just brought, bring it to, you, to your attention. As we can see from this table, there's a lot of room for improvement. And it should be the goal of every agency, large and small, to be at the top of this table, not at the bottom. Having said that, making it to the top of the chart does not guarantee immunity from sex successful cyber attacks. Too many of the bad guys are good at what they do. They're getting better all the time. And we've got to bring our A game to the fight every single day. As we see in the Navy, it's an all hands on deck moment. For those agencies that continue to lag behind, there needs to be enlightened leadership, accountability, and a commitment to continuing improvements. One valuable cybersecurity tool that is available to all federal agencies is the DHS program known as Einstein. And we hasten to add it's not a panacea. It's a system that can record, detect, and block cyber threats. And all of us on this committee have recently heard about the importance of Einstein after the OPM breach. The system used cyber threat information from the OPM data breach to uncover a similar intrusion which we may have never known about at the Department of the Interior. And that's an important discovery. But finding out about the da that data breach after they occur isn't good enough. We want to be able to stop these attacks before they can do any damage. It's my understanding that the newest version of Einstein, we call it Einstein 3A, I think the A is accelerated, isn't it? And accelerated can do just that. Unfortunately, today, less than half of all federal civilian agencies fall under the protection of Einstein's most advanced capabilities. Let me add again, I recognize that this system is not perfect. No one's saying that it is, no system is. But as my colleagues and our staff have heard me say many times uh, before, if it isn't perfect, let's make it better. And from everything I've heard, Einstein 3A is another important and badly needed step toward that goal. That's exactly why Senator Johnson and I, along with our staff members, are working on legislation now to authorize and improve Einstein with the help of some of our witnesses. This legislation would speed up its adoption across the government, require use of leading technologies, and improve accountability and oversight. I look forward to working with my colleagues on this legislation so that we can ensure every agency is equipped with the ever-improving capabilities needed to fend off cyber attacks in the future. In closing, I think it's important to recognize the breach at OPM follows a long list of major cyber attacks against the government and, as we know, our private sector. And there's likely more to come. To tackle a challenge this big, we do need an all-hands-on-deck approach. What does this mean? Simply, it means we need all the people, resources, and authorities that we can reasonably muster to be ready to respond. We can begin by continuing to fill the top spots in our government agencies, something at which this agency has done a personally, I think, a, a superb job. I'm proud of the work that we've done to provide the, uh, the, the top uh, excellent uh, talent to help lead the Department of Homeland Security. OPM, however, has been without a Senate confirmed deputy director for nearly four years. I'll say that again. The Office of Personal Management has been without a Senate confirmed deputy director for nearly four years. It's not that the administration hasn't been submitting the names of qualified and talented candidates for these posts most of the time. For example, the committee has fav this committee has favorably reported out the name of Navy Admiral Earl Gray, the president's nominee for this uh, position at OPM, twice, once last year and again this year. We've done our job here in this committee to vet him, to report him out. It's time to get him confirmed so that the uh, director had, and, the, and the agency had the help they need to write the ship. Finally, we could also build on the cybersecurity legislation we passed last year and pass new legislation like Einstein, like information sharing, like data breach. We have a job to do, and we need to do that our, ourselves. We could also fully fund agency security efforts. These are all important steps we can take, but, they'll, uh, but they will be incredibly difficult to accomplish if we don't work together. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you all for being here. Let's have a... Let's have a good hearing. Thank you, Senator Carper. It is the tradition of this committee to swear in witnesses, so if you'll all stand and rise, raise your right hand. Okay. Wait for the director. 
Good morning, Director. Raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you would give before this committee would be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning, Director. I know traffic can be tough in Washington, D.C., so appreciate you being able to make it here. Um, if you're ready, we'll, we can start with you. Our, our first witness is uh, OPM Director Catherine Archuleta. Ms. Archuleta is the Director of the Office of Personnel Management, a position she has held since November 2013. Prior to serving as Director of OPM, Ms. Archuleta was a Senior Policy Advisor to then Secretary of Energy, Frederico Pena. Uh, Director Archuleta. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Carper, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I understand and I share the concerns and frustrations of federal employees and those affected by the intrusion into OPM's IT systems. Although OPM has taken significant steps to meet our responsibility to secure the personal data of those we serve, it is clear that OPM needs to dramatically accelerate the, those efforts. I am committed to a full and complete investigation of these incidents, and we continue to move urgently to take action to mitigate the long-standing vulnerabilities of the agency systems. In March of 2014, we released our strategic IT plan to modernize and to secure OPM's aging legacy system. We began implementing the plan immediately, and in fiscal years 2014 and 2015, we directed nearly $70 million toward the implementation of new security controls to better protect our systems. OPM is also in the process of developing a new network infrastructure environment to improve the security of OPM infrastructure and IT systems. Once completed, OPM IT systems will be migrated into this new environment from the current legacy networks. Many of the improvements have been to address critical needs, such as security vulnerabilities in our network, these upgrades include the installation of additional firewalls, restriction of remote access without two-factor authentication, continuous monitoring of all connections to ensure that only legitimate connections have access, and deploying anti-malware software across the environment to protect and prevent the, diploma, the diploma, deployment or execution of cybercrime tools that could compromise our networks. These improvements led us to the discovery of the malicious activity that has occurred, and we were able to immediately share the information so that other agencies could protect their networks. I want to share with the committee some new steps that I am taking in addition to the steps we have already taken. First, I will hire a new cybersecurity advisor that will report directly to me. This cybersecurity advisor will work with OPM's CIO to manage ongoing response to the recent incidents and complete development of OPM's plan to mitigate further incidents and assess whether long-term changes to OPM's IT architecture are needed. Second, to ensure that the agency is leveraging private sector best practices and expertise, I'm reaching out to the chief information security officers at leading private sector companies that are experiencing their own significant cybersecurity challenges, and I will host a meeting with these experts in the coming weeks to help identify further steps. I believe that all members of this committee have received a copy of my action plan, and in deference to time limits, I am happy to discuss it further during the questioning. I would like to address now the confusion regarding the number of people affected by two recent related cyber incidents at OPM. First, it is my responsibility to provide as accurate information as I can to Congress, the public, and most importantly, the affected individuals. Second, because this information and its potential misuse concerns their lives, 
It is essential to identify the affected individuals as quickly as possible. Third, we face challenges in analyzing the data due to the form of the records and the way they are stored. As such, I have deployed a dedicated team to undertake this time-consuming analysis and instructed them to make sure their work is accurate and completed as qu quickly as possible. As much as I want to have all answers today, I do not want to be in the position of providing you or the affected individuals with potentially inaccurate data. With these considerations in mind, I want to clarify some of the reports that have appeared in the press. Some press accounts have suggested that the number of affected individuals has expanded from 4 million individuals to 18 million individuals. Other press accounts have asserted that 4 million individuals have been affected in the personnel file incident and 18 million incident individuals have been affected in the background investigation incident. Therefore, I am providing the status as we know it today and reaffirming my commitment to providing more information as soon as we know it. First, the two kinds of data that I am addressing, personnel records and background investigations, affected different systems in two separate but related incidents. Second, the number of individuals with data compromised from the personnel records incident is approximately 4.2 million as we reported on June 4th, and this number has not changed, and we have notified these individuals. Third, as I have noted, we continue to analyze the background investigation as rapidly as possible to best understand what was compromised, and we are not at a point where we are able to provide a more definitive report, uh, report on this issue. That said, I want to address the figure of 18 million individuals that has been cited in the press. It is my understanding that the 18 million refers to a preliminary, unverified, and approximate number of unique social security numbers in the background investigations data. It is not a number that I feel comfortable at this time represents the total number of affected individuals. The social security portion of the number portion of the analysis is still under active review, and we do not have a more definitive number. Also, there may be an overlap between the individuals affected in the background investigation and the personnel file incident. Additionally, we are working to deliberately to deliberately to determine if individuals who have not had their social security numbers compromised but have, may have other information exposed should be considered individuals affected by this incident. For these reasons, I cannot yet provide a more definitive response on the number of individuals affected by the background investigations intrusion, and it may well increase from these initial reports. My team is conducting further analysis with all speed and care, and again, I look forward, excuse me, forward to providing an accurate and complete response. Thank you for the opportunity, and I'm happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you, Madam Director. Our next witness is Mr. Tony Scott. Mr. Scott is the Chief Information Officer for the United States. He was appointed by the President in February of this year. His previous roles include heading VMware's Global Information Technology Group and five years as Chief Information Officer at Microsoft. Mr. Scott. Um, thank you, Chairman Johnson uh, and Ranking Member Carper, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I appreciate the chance to speak with you about recent cyber incidents affecting federal agencies. As federal CIO, my, I lead the Office of Management and Budget's Office of E-Government and Information Technology. And my office is responsible for developing and overseeing the implementation of federal information technology policy. But today I want to focus on my team's role in facing our nation's current reality, confronting ever-evolving cybersecurity threats. Under the Federal Information Security Modernization Act of 2014, we know it as FISMA, OMB is responsible for federal information security oversight and policy issuance. OMB executes its responsibilities in close coordination with its federal cybersecurity partners, including the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Commerce, 
National Institute of Standards and Technology, otherwise known as NIST. Last year, OMB announced the creation of a dedicated cybersecurity unit within my office, the eGov Cyber Unit. The creation of the eGov Cyber Unit reflects OMB's focus on conducting robust, data-driven oversight of agencies' cybersecurity programs and the monitoring and improving of government-wide responses to major cybersecurity incidents, as well as issuing federal guidance consistent with current and emerging technologies and risks. This is also the team behind the annual FISMA report, which highlights both successes and challenges facing federal agency cyber programs. In FY 2015, the eGov Cyber Unit is conducting oversight through CyberStat reviews and will prioritize agencies with high risk factors as determined by cybersecurity performance and incident data. Additionally, the unit is driving FISMA implementation by providing agencies with the guidance they need in this dynamic environment. One of the top FY 2015 policy priorities of the team is updating something known as Circular A130, which is the central government-wide policy document that establishes agency guidelines on how to manage information resources, including best practices for how to secure those resources. As I testified before the House last week, OMB's guidance to, to agencies for implementing the recently passed Federal Information Technology Acquisition Reform Act, known as FATARA, was issued, and it strengthens the role of the CIO in agency cybersecurity, and that's an important uh, piece. To further improve federal cybersecurity infrastructure and protect systems against these evolving threats, OMB launched a 30-day cybersecurity sprint two weeks ago. The sprint team is comprised of staff from OMB, NSC, DHS, and other agencies. We have over 100 people involved in this effort. And at the end of the review, we'll create and operationalize a set of action plans to further address critical cybersecurity priorities and recommend a federal civilian cybersecurity strategy. In addition, Immediately, the 30-day sprint directs agencies to immediately deploy priority threat actor indicators that have been provided by DHS to scan systems and check logs, patch critical vulnerabilities without delay, tighten policies and practices for privileged users, and accelerate the implementation of multi-factor authentication, especially for privileged users. As I mentioned earlier, confronting cybersecurity threats is our nation's reality, a reality I faced during my time in the private sector and continue facing in my new role as Federal Chief Information Officer. Because of this, ensuring the security of information within the federal government's networks and systems will remain a core focus of mine and of the administration. We are moving aggressively to implement innovative protections and respond quickly to new challenges as they arise. In addition to our efforts, we also look forward to working with Congress on actions that may further protect our nation's critical networks and systems. I thank the committee for holding this hearing and for your commitment to improving federal cybersecurity. And I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Our next witness is uh, Dr. Andy Osment. Dr. Osment is the Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity and Communications at the Department of Homeland Security where he leads several of the department's key cyber programs. Prior to his service at DHS, Dr. Osmond was the President's Senior Director for Cybersecurity. Dr. Osmond. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Carper, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today. Like you, my fellow panelists, and countless Americans, I am deeply concerned about the recent compromise at OPM. And I'm dedicated to ensuring that we take all necessary steps to protect our federal workforce and to drive forward the cybersecurity of the federal government. As a result, I want to focus these remarks on how DHS is accelerating our efforts to protect federal agencies and to help federal agencies better protect themselves. To begin with, it's important to note that we are now making up for 20 years of underinvestment in cybersecurity across the public and the private sectors. At the same time, we are facing a major challenge in protecting our most sensitive information against sophisticated, well-resourced and persistent adversaries. This is a complex problem without a simple solution. 
If an easy answer were at hand, this would not be a national challenge. To effectively address this challenge, our federal agencies need to employ defense in depth. Consider protecting a government facility against a physical threat. Adequate security is not only a fence, a camera, or building locks, but a combination of these measures that in aggregate make it difficult for an adversary to gain physical access. Cybersecurity also requires this defense in depth, these multiple layers of security. No one measure is sufficient. Under legislation passed by Congress last year, federal agencies are responsible for their cybersecurity. To assist them, DHS provides a common baseline of security across the civilian government and helps agencies manage their own cyber risk through four key efforts. First, we protect agencies by providing uh, a common set of capabilities through the Einstein and Continuous Diagnostics and Mitigation Program, which we call CDM. Second, we measure and motivate agencies to implement best practices. Third, we serve as a hub for information sharing. And fourth, we provide incident response assistance when agencies suffer an intrusion. In my statement this morning, I will focus on the first area, how DHS provides a baseline of security through Einstein and CDM. I've described the other three areas in my written statement, and I'm happy to take your questions on them. Our first line of defense against cyber threats is the Einstein system, which protects agencies at their perimeter. Returning to the analogy of a physical government facility that I mentioned earlier, Einstein 1 is similar to a camera at the road onto a facility that records all traffic and identifies anomalies in the number of cars entering and leaving. Einstein 2 adds the ability to detect suspicious cars based upon a watch list. Einstein 2 does not stop the cars, but it does set off an alarm. Agencies report that Einstein 1 and 2 are screening over 90% of all federal civilian traffic, and they played a key role in identifying the recent compromise of OPM data hosted at the Department of Interior. The latest phase of the program, as Senator Carper mentioned, is known as Einstein 3A, and it's akin to a guard post at the highway that leads to multiple government facilities. It uses classified information to look at the cars and compare them to a watch list and then it actively blocks prohibited cars from entering the facility. We are accelerating our efforts to protect all civilian agencies with Einstein 3A. The system now protects 15 federal civilian agencies with over 930,000 federal personnel, or approximately 45% of the federal civilian government, with at least one security countermeasure. We've added Einstein 3A protections to over 20% of the federal civilian government in the past nine months alone. During that time, and since its inception, Einstein, has blocked, Einstein 3A has blocked nearly 550,000 attempts to access potentially malicious websites, which is often associated with potential theft of agency data. Now, Einstein 3A is currently a signature-based system it can only block attacks or intrusions that it already knows about. That is necessary, but not sufficient. We are also working on adding other technologies to the Einstein 3A platform that can block never-before-seen intrusions. Because Einstein 3A is not just a set of existing capabilities, it's a platform upon which we can add other capabilities. As we accelerate Einstein deployment, we also recognize that security cannot be achieved through only one type of tool. That's why we need defense in depth. Einstein is not a silver bullet and will never be able to block every threat. For example, it must be complemented with tools that monitor the inside of agency networks. Our CDM program helps address this challenge. Returning again to our analogy of a government facility, CDM phase one allows agencies to continuously check the building locks inside the facility to ensure they're operating as they're intended to. Continuing the analogy, the next two phases will monitor personnel on the facility to make sure they're not engaging in unauthorized actions, and will actively assess activity across the facility to detect unusual patterns of behavior. We have purchased CDM Phase 1 capabilities for eight agencies, covering over 50% of the federal civilian government, and we expect to purchase these capabilities for 97% of the civilian government by the end of this fiscal year. Now, the deadlines I've just told you for both CDM and Einstein are when DHS provides a given capability. It takes additional time, months, for agencies to each then implement the capability for both Einstein and CDM. 
And of course, agencies must supplement Einstein and CDM with their own tools appropriate to the needs of that existing agency. I'd like to conclude by noting that federal agencies are a rich target, and they will continue to experience frequent attempted intrusions. As our detection methods continue to improve, we will, in fact, detect more incidents, incidents that are already occurring that we don't know about. The recent breach at OPM is emblematic of this trend, as OPM was able to detect the intrusions by implementing best practices. We are accelerating the deployment of the tools we have, and we are bringing cutting-edge capabilities online. And we're asking our partner agencies and Congress to take action and work with us to strengthen the cybersecurity of the federal, agent, uh, federal government. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Osment. Our next and last witness is uh, Mr. Patrick McFarland. Mr. McFarland is the Inspector General for the Office of Personnel Management, a position he has held since 1990 making him the longest serving Inspector General in the federal government. He has 30 years of service in law enforcement, including 22 years at the Secret Service. Uh, first of all, sir, thank you for your service, and we look forward to your testimony. Mr. McFarland. Thank you. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Carper, and members of the committee, my name is Patrick McFarland. I am the Inspector General at the Office of U.S. Personnel Management. Thank you for inviting me to testify today at the hearing regarding the IT security audit work performed by our office. I am accompanied by Lewis Parker, my Deputy Assistant Inspector General for Audits, who, with your permission, may assist in answering any technical questions you may have. OPM has a long history of systemic failures to, pro to properly manage its IT infrastructure, which may have ultimately led to the breaches we are discussing today. First, I would like to discuss some of the findings from our annual audits under the Federal Information Security Management Act, known as FISMA. We have identified three general areas of concern, which are discussed in detail in my written testimony. They are, one, information security governance. This is the management structure and process the for that form the foundation of a successful security program. It is vital to have centralized governance structure. OPM has made improvements in this area, but we still have some concerns. Two, security assessments and authorizations. This is a comprehensive assessment of each IT system to ensure that it meets the applicable security standards before allowing the system to operate. Our 2014 FISMA audit found that 11 of OPM's 47 systems were operating without a valid authorization. Tech three, technical security controls. OPM has implemented, implemented a variety of controls to make the agency IT system more secure. However, these tools must be used properly and must cover the entire IT environment. We are concerned that they do not. The second issue I would like to briefly discuss is the flash audit alert that I issued last week in 2014, OPM began a massive project to overhaul the agency's IT environment by building an entirely new infrastructure called the Shell and migrating all of its systems to that Shell from the existing infrastructure. We have two serious concerns with how the project is being implemented. First, OPM is not following proper IT project management procedures and therefore does not know the true scope and cost of this project. The agency never prepared a project charter or conducted a feasibility study or even identified all of the applications that will have to be moved from the existing IT infrastructure to the new shell environment. Further, the agency did not prepare the mandatory major IT business case, formerly known as the Exhibit, Exhibit 300. This document is an important step in the planning of any large-scale IT project as it forces the agency to conduct a detailed cost-benefit analysis, as well as a risk evaluation, among other things. OPM apparently believes this is simply an administrative exercise. We disagree. Because OPM has not conducted these very basic planning steps, it does not know the true cost of the project and cannot provide an accurate time frame for completion. OPM has estimated that this project will cost $93 million. However, that amount includes only strengthening the agency's current IT 
security posture and the creation of a new shell environment. It does not include the cost of migrating all of OPM's 50 major IT systems and numerous subsystems to the shell. This migration will be the most costly and complex phase of this project. Even if the 93 million figure was an accurate estimate, the agency does not have a dedicated funding stream for the project. Therefore, it is entirely possible that OPM could run out of funds before completion, leaving the agency's IT environment more vulnerable than it is now. The second major point discussed in the alert relates to the use of a sole source contract. OPM has con contracted with a single vendor to complete all of the multiple phases of this project. Unless there is a, a specific exception, federal contracts are supposed to be subject to full and open competition. However, there is an exception for our compelling and urgent situations. The first phase of this project, which involves securing OPM's IT environment, was indeed such a compelling and urgent situation. <clears throat> that phase addressed a crisis, namely the breaches that occurred that last year. However, the later phases, such as migrating the applications to the new shell environment, are not urgent. Instead, they involve work what is, they involve work what is essentially a long-term capital investment. OPM has indicated that the contract for the migration phase has not been awarded. We have not been provided documentation that OPM is soliciting bids from other contractors for this work, even though this work is supposedly underway. This supports our concern that the current vendor's contract covers all phases of this project. It may sound counterintuitive, but OPM must slow down and not continue to barrel forward with this project. The agency must take the time to get it right the first time, to determine the scope of the project, calculate the costs, and make a clear plan about how to implement this massive overhaul. OPM cannot afford to have this project fail. I fully support OPM's efforts to modernize its IT en environment and the director's long-term goals. However, if it's not done correctly, the agency will be in a worse situation than it is today, and millions of taxpayer dollars will have been wasted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. I'd like to start my questioning with you. Um, looking back at the, your audits under the Federal Information Security Management Act, uh, if we just start with fiscal year 2009, uh, you don't have to go much further than the first or second page of the executive summary to understand that uh, uh, security of the IT systems has been a problem. Um, in, in your November 5, 2009 report, uh, uh, you report lack of adequate information security governance activities in accordance with legislative and regulatory requirements. In, your November 10, 2010 report, you say, we also expanded the material weaknesses related to IT security policies to include concerns with the agency's overall information security governance and its information security management structure. In your November 2011 report, you say, we continue to believe that information security governance represents a material weakness in OPM's IT security program. November 5, uh, 2012, and this, this is actually pretty troubling because in the audit, the Office of uh, Chief Information Officer response to your draft audit report indicated that they disagreed with the classification of the material weakness because of the progress that OPM had made with its IT security program and because there was no loss of sensitive data during the fiscal year. However, the OCIO's statement is inaccurate as there were in fact numerous information security incidents in FY 2012 that led to the loss or unauthorized release of mission critical or sensitive data. In other words, in 2012 report, uh, the Office of, of Chief Information Officer was in a state of denial. November 20, 21, 2013, second page of your report says that OPM's decentralized government structure continues to result in many instances of non-compliance with FISMA requirements. Therefore, we are again reporting this issue as a material weakness for FY 2013. 2014, probably the best thing you can say in terms of improvements is the material weaknesses related to information security governance has been upgraded to a significant deficiency 
due to the planned reorganization of OCIO. And again, I'm, I'm highly concerned about this flash audit. Uh, on the infrastructure improvement project, your conclusion, as a result, there's a high risk that this project will mm -hmm. fail to meet the objectives of providing a secure operating environment for OPM systems and applications. And you go on to say, in our opinion, the project management approach to this major infrastructure overhaul is entirely inadequate and introduces a very high risk of project failure. It's pretty clear that security of the IT system has been a problem material problem for quite some, some time. Now, when uh, Director Archuleta w came before this uh, committee in this Senate for confirmation in her uh, written answers to our questions, she said, if confirmed as Director of OPM, improved management of OPM's IT, including proper security and data management, will be one of my top priorities. I will work with OPM CIO and IG to ensure that adequate measures are in place to protect this vital information. Mr. McFarland. Has Director Archuleta, has she ever met you, with you specifically to discuss the results of your FISMA audits? No, sir. Do you meet with her regularly? Meet with her at least once a month. To what extent have you ever discussed <clears throat> the material problems with the security of the IT systems of OPM? The memorandum in front of me is, is dated June 17th from, from us to the director. And it spells out the uh, flash audit alert with a lot of information in it. And that, that was presented uh, to her office. One week prior to that, we, we made sure that the uh, uh, chief of staff had a copy to, to help the flow of information for us. But we have not sat down, the director and I, regarding this. We have not, we have not heard back other than last Tuesday when we received the response to our flash audit response. So, so do you believe that her statement that she would work mm -hmm. with OPM, CIO, and IG to ensure that adequate measures are in place to protect this vital information, do you, do you believe she's fulfilled that, that uh, commitment? Well, I don't, I don't believe she's f fulfilled that commitment specifically with me, but I would assume, and maybe right, maybe wrong, but I would assume that her explanation in entails the CIO's involvement well, with our office. But here's the problem. We've had three material breaches under her watch. Uh, on March 2014, the Chinese breach, o <clears throat> breach OPM looking for background investigations. And of course, we're, we're the subject of this hearing is the most, two most recent breaches. Director Archuleta, do you believe you fulfilled that commitment that you made to this committee and this Senate that you will work with OPM's IG to ensure that adequate measures are in place to protect this vital information? I believe I'm fulfilling that commitment, sir. Um, with regard to uh, the strategic plan that uh, I promised that I would um, develop during my I promised in the confirmation is that we have moved towards that and your concerns about governance are exactly right. There was not a governance structure and it was uh, one of the first things I did was to hire a capable and so, qualified CIO. Again, my time's running out. Why have you not met with the inspector general who we is tasked with these audits and has given you a lot of, you know, it's basically laid out the problem for you. Why haven't you met and discussed this problem with the inspector general? Uh, thank you. We do meet on a monthly basis. And but not to it, talk about this IT security situation. Um, the agenda... Which is going to be a top priority of your uh, term. Yes. Uh, the agenda is set by the IG, and he has been very helpful in identifying issues throughout the agency. Uh, with regard to the flash audit, uh, the, the, my staff and his staff are meeting on Tuesday. We've not had a meeting since his release of the flash audit, but he and I will follow up w first with staff, and then we have a meeting together. We've not, as Mr. McFarland indicated, had the opportunity to meet yet, but it, I'm, sure, and I'm sure it was his intention and always my intention that we would sit down and discuss this, as we have with all other issues. Have, have you spoken to the president about this breach? Yes, I have spoken to the president. When? Um, it was about this breach, about the most recent breach of yes, the 4.1 million to possibly 18 million. I did brief the president records. on this, and he has 
made it repeatedly clear that cyber threats are one of his most serious economic and national security challenges as we face the nation. And he has, in his administration, pursued a comprehensive strategy, including the appointment of Tony Scott, boosting our defenses in government and sharing more information. He's also directed the establishment of a cyber intelligence center and called on the Congress to pass legislation. Okay, wh wh when did you speak with the president about this? Um, approximately two weeks ago. Do, do, do you understand the full gravity of the risk to this nation, the risk to people's lives, uh, government officials that are, that are trying to protect this nation because of the release of this information? Of course I do. Of course I do. I am as upset as you are about this. And that is why we've worked from day one to set in place the steps that had not existed there before. And I think and if you uh, notice in the plan that I've sent you, we've taken significant steps towards that. But we're looking at nearly 30 years of a legacy system and no improvements prior to the time that I got there. Not none, but not enough. And so as you look at the at the improvements we have made, certainly we've made important steps, but we need to make more, and that's why we're asking Congress for their support. Okay, uh, Senator Carper. I'm gonna yield my time at this point to Senator Tester, who needs to go at an Appropriations Committee, Marco. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, thank you, Tom Carper. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Uh, Director Archuleta, was the cause of the initial breach uh, because of a compromised credential of an employee uh, of a contractor of Keypoint Government Solutions? Um, my, um, my colleagues would be very uh, much more uh, able to respond to that, but uh, yes, it was uh, the first uh, issue was a, a, the a use of a, of a uh, credential. Compromised credential. A compromised credential. You would agree with that? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir, I would agree with that. Thank you. Uh, Director Archuleta, do you plan to continue OPM's relationship with Keypoint? Yes, sir. We have found that um, they have responded to all of the remediation efforts that we've, we've asked them to perform. So it would be fair to say that you believe Keypoint uh, is able to keep its data and credentials secure at this point? Yes, sir. I do believe that that's true. Okay. They've made important strides. Okay. I.G. McFarland, in your estimation, is Keypoint sufficiently updated its access uh, to its systems to ensure that its data and credentials are secure? We do not know that at this time. Who would know that? I would hope the CIO would know it. Okay. Um, has OPM updated their systems to uh, ensure that data and credentials are secure? Mr. I.G. McFarland? I believe, yes, they, they, they have been working on the tactical aspect of the, uh, of the infrastructure, which is to, which is to update the present uh, environment. Do you feel that their systems are secure at this point? No, I do not feel that they're secure at this point. No. Okay. Um, Mr. Uh, or I.G. McFarland, based on what you know so far, uh, do you believe that OPM should continue its relationship with Keypoint? I'd have to have more information. I, I, I would not be able to answer that right now. Okay. Okay. Um, Director Archuleta, as part of your testimony, you also include recommendations to improve cybersecurity at OPM. Including these recommendations, you call on Congress for additional support in order to accelerate upgrades for OPM's IT infrastructure. <clears throat> uh, Director, as a part of this additional support, are you requesting funding for additional IT software developers and IT support personnel? We're very much focused on the additional money to improve our security. Yes, that's the, the primary reason for the request for additional funds. Okay, and so who have you made that request to? Uh, we're in the process of developing that request. We hope to have it to you by the end of this week. And we're working very closely with OMB on that. Okay, do you have any idea on how much that will be? I, I don't have the, the idea right now, sir, but um, I think there has been an initial number that uh, we're focused in on, and I'd be glad to get that to you okay. uh, by the end of this week. You talked about gleaning some of the information on a private sector cybersecurity. Are you are you going to? Uh, you said that you were going to, uh, in your opening testimony. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I heard was is that you were going to go to the private sector to find out some methods that they utilize. Yes. Um, the. The issue of cybersecurity. And if that's correct, just yes, say it is okay. correct. Okay, are, yes. are you going to the financial industry? We'll be going throughout the industry, and financial, I'm sure, will be part of that, sir, yes. Okay. 
Because they're getting attacked literally every night. Yes. And they seem to be doing a reasonable job at this point in time of fending those attacks off. That's the type of expertise we'll want to we'll know about and uh, learn about. Okay. Um, many times the private sector offers employees in software development and IT uh, pretty damn generous benefits and pay. Um, yet, at the federal government, we've had to endure government shutdowns. In recent years, we've seen threat after threat, cutting retirement, threat to cut wages, uh, not exactly what I would say good recruiting and retention efforts. How, how is OPM addressing uh, recruiting problems, um, uh, not only uh, in your supplemental request for dollars, but um, in general? Uh, thank you for that question, sir. Um, I have actually been working very close, well, I've been working very closely and had uh, several conversations with the private sector that faces this uh, same problem. The, it, the need for cybersecurity experts and, 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 frankly, IT experts is one that both the public and private sector uh, uh, are in great need of, and we're working together with them and also uh, working with our internal partners at uh, in all of the agencies to determine ways through hiring through hiring flexibilities, recruiting flexibilities, and um, and um, salary flexibilities to bring these individuals in. What we have found is that there's a great deal of interest in public service, and uh, this is something that we're uh, focused in on and the recruitment of, of uh, individuals both at the millennials and uh, okay. mid-career. Okay, this is for either you, Mr. Scott, or Mr. Rosemont. Which one of you said that this is due to an underinvestment in cybersecurity over the last 20 years? Is that you, Mr. Rosemont? That was me, sir. Okay. So um, so we're sitting here on this side of the dais. Some of us are appropriators, but we're all concerned about national security. Who should we be listening to about where we need to make those investments? Uh Ultimately, you need to listen to each agency and their CIO because they know their environment best. Um, I know that uh, what we have come forward, Department of Homeland Security, and our budget request to uh, for my organization yes. uh, also supports government-wide security programs, and we need a combination of those government-wide programs and individual agencies. Do we have a do we have a plan like that currently? I mean, do we have a government-wide program for cybersecurity that actually my, the way I visualize my head actually has tentacles out to each agency? Um, we have a, uh, a number of documents that in combination lay out our government-wide approach, uh, in part influenced by the recent passing of the FISMA modernization in December of 2014. Um, and so uh, those com documents in aggregate lay out the approach that we're taking. Is that effective? I mean, uh, do, is, is, the, is the infrastructure effective to do what we need to do? Uh, or do we I, have to add to that? You understand what I'm asking? I, okay. I do. Um, there's always a, a, a balance between spending your time writing documents and spending your time doing the actual work. Yes, um, really. I think we're at a point right now where we have, you know, a lot of guidance has been issued. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, there's been a lot of focus on how we move forward. I think we're at the point now where we need to focus on, on the execution. All right. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, especially you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Chairman McCain has got to uh, be somewhere else. We're going to let him go next, if that's okay, Senator Booker. Okay. Senator McCain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh, Senator Booker for his indulgence. Uh, <coughs> Ms. Archuleta, according to New York Times, stated, while Mr. Obama publicly named North Korea as a country that attacked Sony Pictures Entertainment last year, he and his aides have described the Chinese hackers in the government records case only to members of Congress in classified hearings. Blaming the Chinese in public could affect cooperation on limiting the Iranian nuclear program and tension with China's Asian neighbors. Are you ready to state that uh, since it's been in all public <coughs> Periodical said it was China responsible for this hacking? I think um, that that would be a question. I, that's a pretty simple answer. Are you ready to say that it was Chinese hacking or not? I would have to defer to, to uh, the, our, my colleagues at state. So the answer is no. State, I, would, I would defer to my colleagues at state to respond to that. So the answer is no. You will and not, even though it's all in public 
acknowledge that it was China. You're not ready to tell this committee that you know that it was China that was responsible for the hacking. Is that true? Um, OPM is not responsible for attribution. We le rely on our colleagues to talk about that. Your committee, your, your business is to, is to track and to respond to hacking and, well, the, um, I, I'd like to go back to the issue. You said you didn't know where the figure of 18 million Social Security numbers came from. This is a Wall Street Journal article. Mm -hmm. A senior FBI official interjected, said it was based on her agency's own data, these people said of 18.2 million. Are you ready to uh, acknowledge that the FBI's uh, number of 18.2 million is accurate? Um, as I stated in my opening remarks, sir, um, I don't believe that that is an accurate number and I will not give an so accurate So the FBI number. is giving us incorrect information? I'm, I, don't, I don't have an understanding of where they assumed that 18 number, but have I Have you met with the FBI? Is, uh, my uh, associates have met with the FBI. Your associates have, but you haven't. No, sir, I have not met Why with the FBI. Why wouldn't you when there's a, there's a clear situation here of an allegation by the most respected law enforcement agency in America of 18.2 million? You're alleging that it's 4 million. Wouldn't you sit down with the director of the FBI and say, hey, the American people need to know, especially those 14 million between 4 and 18 million that may have been breached? Uh, as the head of the agency, I have many people who are working on a number of different issues. This is an important question that you've asked me. And uh, since the time that uh, I guess that my number... question again is, why wouldn't you sit down with the FBI people and find out where they got their information so there you are can many... corroborate it or, or deny it? My uh, colleagues have met with the FBI and... But you have. Discussed... It's not, no. It doesn't rise to your level of attention, I see. Now... What about the hundreds of millions of prescription drug claims and health records OPM holds to detect fraud in the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program? Are those at risk? Uh, the, the enrollment forms are part of the data, and as I said uh, in my statement again, that we're analyzing the data right now. You, you won't does, tell the committee whether they're at risk or not? I will... Uh, share with you that we're analyzing this data to see the scope of the impact of this breach. Mr. McFarland, your office has been warning OPM about the vulnerability of its data for years. How were these warnings received by the agency and why were they apparently ignored until it was too late? Well, I, I don't know why they were ignored, but they certainly... But they were ignored. But yes, they were ignored in my, in my estimation. Yes. So... They just received it, sort of like Ms. Archuleta received the information from the FBI. Probably may not have risen to the level of her interest. Now, Ms. Archuleta, you made a great uh, an interesting statement. You told a Senate Appropriations Committee Tuesday that no one at OPM is personally to blame for the data breach. However, she told the House panel Wednesday, quote, I hold all of us responsible that's our job at OPM to protect the data. In other words, everybody's responsible, so nobody's <clears throat> responsible. But you are responsible, and I wonder whether you think, since you said, I hold all of us responsible, do you think you should, you should stay in your present position? Senator, I have been working hard from day one to correct decades of neglect. Ig and ignoring I the, it, and I ignoring will, Mr. McFarland's uh, I, I've been here warnings. for 18 months, sir, and I've worked very hard. I think uh, we've done taken great strides, not only within OPM and in partnership, throughout government. Cybersecurity is an enterprise effort in this administration, and I work closely with them. I am committed to continuing to do that. Well, unfortunately, you are not committed to he heeding the warnings of, uh, of Mr. McFarland, apparently, at least according to his uh, assessment. I guess my final question is, which I'm sure you will probably obfuscate, when will the American people know? When, when will they know the extent of this penetration, which has violated the privacy of, at least in the, in the estimation of the FBI, 18 million people? 
Thank you for that question. And as I stated earlier, we're working as rapidly we, as we can. I have a team that is working that is devoted to this. And you have but no. I will be want, I'll, and you I'll have no want, estimate for the committee as to when this. When I know that the that the number is accurate, that's the time. But you can't tell us when you would. When I know the number is accurate. So, but you can't tell us when. When they when they bring me an accurate, I, I have confidence in that number. Ms. Archlett, I must say that I've seen a lot of performances. Yours ranks in one of the most interesting. I, I reeled back. Thank you, Chairman Kane. Uh, because Senator Booker did yield, I'll let you go before Senator Erst. Thank you very much. Uh, these days it's surprising to see somebody letting New Jersey go before Iowa. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I understand that the uh, uh, Ms. Archuleta, I understand that the OPM Inspector General recommended the shutdown of OPM's IT infrastructure system before we knew about the hacks. Uh, did you follow the IG's guidance, and if not, why? I did not follow his guidance because I had to make a very conscious and deliberate decision as to the impact of the shutdown of those systems. I would have had to shut down the processing of the annuity checks to retirees. I would have had to shut down the system that does background investigations for, uh, for uh, the FAA or for TSA. It would have meant that those individuals and the needs that they, uh, those new hirees and the services they would provide would not have been able to be uh, provided. I made a conscious decision that we would move forward with this, but would make improvements as rapidly as possible, and we have done that. And uh, the opportunity to work with the IG, I would say, is one that I feel very important, is an important part of, uh, of everything that we think about, but uh, I also know that I have responsibility in many areas across OPM. Okay. Mr. Scott, um you are America's chief information officer. It's a, it's a very uh, obviously important and big task. And I want to ask you very specifically, do you believe uh, Ms. Archuleta and Donna Seymour are equipped to lead uh, the efforts to shore up OPM's cybersecurity in the wake of these attacks? Do you believe uh, that their leadership is, is capable uh, of dealing uh, with this uh, tremendous trial? I do, sir, and I've um, spent time on the ground with the teams that are in OPM doing the work, both from DHS and uh, the OPM teams. They are working really, really hard and doing the right things. I've talked to them about the leadership that they're getting from um, uh, both Director Archuleta and Donna Seymour, and they tell me that um, they are um, uh, very, very supportive of the uh, efforts and the leadership that they see there. And the one comment I would make is I think we need to be uh, careful about distinguishing fire starters from firefighters uh, in this particular case that they have my full support. So, and you have a tremendous professional background. You, you understand the field, not only in the private but the public sector. Uh, given you know what you know going on around the country and, and, and meeting these attacks that are happening, uh, uh, you know, frankly, the, the incredible uh, nature of attacks going on on uh, dozens of companies that uh, are all named brands, things we've seen in the media. Uh, given that whole field, do you think she is the person equipped uh, to do the job, as you say, of firefighting? Uh, yes, sir, and I've been impressed with the deployment of the additional tools. I would say, um, you know, the work that's going on in OPM right now would serve as a template and a model for work that other agencies need to do as well. Um, we're learning on this across the whole federal government, and one of the goals of my office is to take all those lessons learned and apply them broadly across the federal government, working with my colleagues in DHS and elsewhere. Uh, we have to learn from this, and we have to be much faster as a federal government in responding to what is a very rising uh, and fast rising and fast morphing uh, set of threats. This is not um, a small challenge. I appreciate that. Back, Mr. Archuleta, uh, there have been at least two instances of OPM systems being hacked. Uh, can you just explain, please, how the first and second breaches occurred 
what steps uh, you have taken to prevent the f a future breach, and what have you done to protect the dedicated public servants who have been affected by this breach? Certainly, thank you for that question. Um, the, the first breach occurred in April, and uh, the, the, um, to the personnel, uh, the employee personnel records. Um, as a result of the, uh, of the investigation around that, we found the second breach uh, later. Um, the forensic part of it, I think my colleague uh, Andy Osmond would be better uh, able to respond to. But since that time, we have not, we have instituted uh, even more security uh, measures into our system. And at this time, we are unaware of any other uh, efforts to, to come into the system. And we're ob obviously monitoring that constantly 24 seven through our, through our, uh, through our center. And if you can answer this question quickly, Dr. Osmond will have a chance to add to that question, but th this, there's been much uh, pointed questions towards you about the discrepancies uh, between the numbers. The first attack, everything was consistent. We knew what those numbers were. Uh, this attack, uh, they're not being consistently reported, as has been pointed out by my colleagues, uh, and we're having these varying numbers. Just can you explain why that is, and hopefully leaving about 20 seconds of yes, my 90 that, seconds? That's what I mentioned in my, uh, my opening statement, sir. The first uh, incident was 4.2 million, and uh, we haven't determined the scope of the second incident yet. And, and you're, you had some pointed questions as to why that is, why are there varying numbers? Because I, I do want them to be accurate. And so you're holding back giving a number until you have all the information. We have a team that is doing the analysis even as we speak to make sure that we're diff we will uh, uh, announce a, a, an accurate number. Right, so be premature would be to be an inaccurate. That's exactly right. Uh, uh, I do have uh, 55 seconds, sir. Could you just add a little bit more to what's being done? Uh, absolutely. I'll, I'll, um, I can speak to the, the timeline of the incident itself. Um, in April, OPM detected this incident because they've been rolling out security capabilities um, over the last year and, and you know, potentially additional time frame. And so if they hadn't rolled out those capabilities, we would never know that this intrusion So the upgrades you all were doing uh, um, in order to promote better hygiene, in order to do the right things, was a reason why we detected the attack that had occurred uh, more than a year earlier. That's right. So OPM's upgrades are what detected the attack. Um, they notified DHS, my organization, immediately. Um, we used the information they provided to detect the second intrusion at the Department of Interior Data Center. Um, and the team since then have been on the ground doing the forensics analysis. In May, they were able to, to assess with high confidence that the 4.2 million personnel records had been exfiltrated from the Department of Interior Data Center. That's OPM's data, but at the Department of Interior Data Center. Um, in June, they assessed that some amount of information had been exfiltrated from OPM itself. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's complicated databases, and, and that's the analysis OPM is currently doing to figure out what exactly was the data that was taken. Thank you, Dr. Asman. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your deference to the people in New Jersey. <laughs> Thanks, Senator Booker. I'll, always looking out for the folks in New Jersey yeah. and Iowa. Senator Ernst. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Booker, and uh, thank you, Ranking Member. Thank you, Mr. Chair, very much. Um, this is a significant data breach. We, you know, we will talk about this all the day, all the day. But uh, bottom line, we need to see some action on this immediately. Um, Mr. McFarland, uh, thank you for being here today. We've we've heard in your testimony. We have seen. Uh, your flash audit alert that was released by your office earlier this month. And in that audit alert, you did highlight your serious concerns regarding OPM's management of its new IT project, the improvement project. And I can't overstate the importance of project management, particularly with respect to projects as complex and important as this particular project. Uh, in fact, just yesterday in this committee, we did improve, approve a bill introduced by Senator Heitkamp and myself, uh, which will focus on improving program management in the federal government. And I would be interested to learn from you just a little bit more detail about your concerns to OPM's management of this IT improvement project. Yes, Senator. Um, I think a, a good start here and a good example would be the f fact that 
anyone doing a capital asset in the IT world, at least, mm -hmm. at least my understanding, and I can be corrected if I'm wrong, uh, by OMB's uh, regulation is to do a, a business plan known as Exhibit 300. That has not been done by OPM. Yet, I do hear in the last few days uh, information that OPM and OMB are working very closely together, and I don't doubt that. But my, my concern is something as simple and straightforward as a business plan, if it's not completed, and we hear it is completed by OPM, and then our documentation that we requested shows that it has not been done, I'd like to find out. I, I don't necessarily want to use this form for my question, but it, it's, I think it goes to the heart of your question, is what has happened with this business plan? Has it been done or not? And that, to me, is a significant mm -hmm. failure, significant failure that the fact that something so simple as a business plan cannot be produced for this project. Um, which left millions of federal employees and their data at risk. So, uh, Ms. Archuleta, I, I do want to follow up because it sounds like now uh, there, there is a request for additional dollars. And what we want to ensure is that if the dollars are allocated, that it will actually be put towards this project and that mm. we do see results and that it is managed wisely. I can't say that dollars we've put forth so far have been utilized maybe to the best of uh, the taxpayers' um, interests. So if you could address that, just give us that assurance that this will be handled. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, in his flash audit, the Inspector General recommended the completion of a major IT business case document for fiscal year 2017. And uh, I actually look forward to discussing with the Inspector General the practical uh, implications of completing such a document for submission for fiscal year 2017. We're in an urgent situation. I do understand, though, his concerns, and I'd like to assure him that all of our decisions are being tracked, documented, and justified, and that we're working very closely with OMB. As I mentioned earlier, I think that the flash audit uh, um, discussions need to occur between me and uh, the IG, and we will do that. We have our staffs are meeting next Tuesday, and I'm sure Mr. McFarland and I will meet immediately following. The important thing is that we address his concerns, but I think the other thing is that we move quickly. As, as uh, Tony and Andy have already described, we're in a very urgent situation, so we need to balance and make sure that we're doing all the things that the IG has described, but as well, we understand the urgency of moving, moving forward aggressively. Mm -hmm. I, I do appreciate that, but this is rather uh, late, and in re retrospect, we can't go take back the data that has been captured by whoever this, this person or entity is out there that has has uh, gotten into the system, who has breached and gotten this data. Uh, one thing that maybe we haven't discussed yet is the fact that not only do we have millions of federal records, employee records that were breached, but I know when I felt uh, or when I filled out the applications for security clearances in the military, not only was my personal information on those forms, but I had to list references. Uh, on those forms. Their information is also included in this. So we have not only millions of federal employees, potential federal employees, but all of their references information is there as well. How many more millions of people are we talking about? Have we alerted those people? And what's going to be done to follow up on their information as well? Thank you for that question. It's an important question, and I agree with you totally. I'm as upset as you are at the fact that this, these documents or this information has been breached. Here's what we're doing, as I mentioned in my testimony, and why I cannot give a number right now. When we look at, for example, the uh, the background investigation. There is a lot of information in that. Some of that contains, if there's a name, some of it does contain PII, and some of it doesn't. 
And so as we're, as we're uh, analyzing the type of data that is in these files, those are the things that we're looking at because we care as deeply as you do that we notify those who have been affected by this and also understand those who have not been affected it through, even though you may have mentioned them in your FS, SF-86. We're doing a complete analysis of that and that's why I'm very hesitant not to put out a number until we are absolutely sure we have looked at the whole range of, of, uh, of uh, possible Im uh, impact. Thank you today for the testimony. Yes, sir. Senator, if I may make one other point. Can yes. you get, is it all right? Uh, the funding is, is a prime example of our concern. It's all over the, it's all over the board. Uh, the situation basically is in, in 2015, OPM is dealing with $32 million. And in, in 2000, 2016, uh, appropriate or asking for an appropriation of another 21,000. In the meantime, DHS has provided them 5 million. And the other 67 million is going to come, I believe from what I understand, is supposed to come from the program areas at OPM. Uh, that, that's so sporadic, it's, it, it, it just doesn't hold water from our perspective as to having a funding source ahead of time for the full, for the full program, it's like playing catch up, and the the worst part of that is that the OPM program offices are are going to be tasked to pay for that from their program office funds, appropriated funds, pay for the uh, migration of each of their systems, instead of having a big picture of funding very clear for everybody. Plus, I think, you know, the, the OMB uh, is very much in favor of having transparency, and this, this just avoids transparency. It subsumes the money coming from program offices instead of a dedicated for, a source of funding. Thank you. I think that's an exceptional point. Thank you for the, allowing the additional mm -hmm. response. Thank you, Senator. And so I, I do want to point out, as best as I can determine the information given to me, we spend something like $80 billion, $80 billion per year on IT systems in the federal government. So this is, this is a problem of management. It's a problem of prioritization. And that's why I pointed out in my opening statement that this is, <clears throat> should be a top priority of the federal government. If it was made a top priority, there should be plenty of funding within the current budget to provide this kind of security. Senator Carper. It's been uh, raised uh, uh, who's behind this hack, uh, this latest hack at OPM, a series of hacks. And um, uh, <clears throat> someone just gave me a, a <clears throat> copy of an <throat> article that quotes uh, uh, our uh, FBI director, uh, Comey. And um, here's what, one of the things is here. It says there are two kinds of big companies uh, in the United States. Those, uh, there are those that have been hacked by uh, the Chinese and those who don't know they've been hacked by the Chinese. He goes on to say that um, they're prolific, their strategy seems to be, will just be everywhere all the time, and there's no way they can stop us. He goes on to say, Bonnie and Clyde could not do a thousand robberies in the same day in all 50 states from their pajamas halfway around the world. And those are the, uh, the words of James, uh, James Comey. Uh, I thought I'd just share them with all of you today as we reflect on our inability to do a perfect job protecting our, uh, our uh, uh, sensitive information uh, within the federal government. I, um, I'm going to go from here to a, a hearing on uh, how do we fund transportation uh, in, the, in our, our country. And I think there's a corollary here, uh, uh, Ms. Archuleta, uh, between your uh, uh, failure to be able to come in in 18 months to turn this around. Uh, uh, we, I, I think there's a, there's a corollary here, and I'll, I'll just use transportation. And I, I want my colleagues, I think we need to be fair, okay? I'm a Navy guy, so I think you, my colleagues know. Uh, there we have a tradition in the Navy. If you're the commanding officer of the ship, your ship runs aground in the middle of the night, you're sound asleep in your wardroom, we hold the captain responsible. Some people say that's not fair, but that's our tradition in the Navy. You're the captain of this ship, and, uh, and uh, so you're held uh, responsible, whether that's fair or not. Having said that, 
I'm reminded of a situation where, let's say, it's, we're not talking about personal management. Let's say we're talking about transportation in our country. We all know we have roads, highways, bridges, transit systems that are decrepit, failing, uh, and we need to do something about it. Uh, let's say we, say we uh, confirm a Secretary of Transportation 18 months ago. We don't give that Secretary of Transportation the money, which we're not doing, that's needed to be able to fix our roads, highways, bridges, and transit systems. And not only that, we don't confirm a, uh, a deputy to be part of the team, the leadership team at the Department of Transportation. It, it's been four years since we've had a deputy. And again, Navy, in the Navy, you've got a commanding officer, you're the commanding officer. The deputy is the executive officer. And this, this important agency has been without an executive officer for four years. Part of that responsibility is the administration because they didn't send us somebody, they didn't send us a name for a long time. They did last year. They sent us a great guy, Navy guy, Naval Academy, commanded ships, aircraft squadrons, has all kinds of uh, credentials. And we need to get him confirmed. This committee's done its job. Now we've got to get him confirmed so you have the help that you need. In terms of help that you need, uh, this committee, I think, did some pretty remarkable things last year in terms of legislation. We took uh, the old uh, Federal Information Security Management Act and we modernized it. That's being implemented now. We took, uh, we said the Department of Homeland Security doesn't have the kind of uh, workforce capabilities that they need to hire and retain the sort of talent that they need to fight these cyber wars. We've addressed that. You're beginning to implement and use those, uh, those skills at DHS. We took your op center, the end, so-called end kick, and made it real. We authorized it and said this is, gonna, this is a real deal and let's uh, uh, not just pay attention to them, but let's give them the, the, author, uh, the authority they need. We uh, said let's look at our federal information technology and our acquisition system, see what we can do to reform them and, and give them the kind of oomph that they uh, require. We've done all those things. We've done all those things. But there's some things we haven't done. There's some things we haven't done. Uh, and we've, I've heard enough on Einstein 3 in the last week that I'm convinced that that's something we ought to do. And Einstein 1, Einstein 2, good, good start. But the 3, 3A is, is, is obviously uh, important. I thought you gave us, uh, Andy, I thought you gave us a real good explanation. I'm going to ask you to come back and just explain again external, internal, the idea of the building, the, you know, the locks, the vault inside, and how Einstein, um, Einstein 3 um, actually interfaces with what I think you call CDM, the Continued di Diagnostic uh, Mitigation Approach, which is more like the inside uh, protection as opposed to Einstein 2, which is the outside protection. And uh, would you just run that bias again? It's, it's, a, it's a very helpful explanation. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator Carper. Um, so the, the most important concept here is the concept of defense in depth. That you speak just a lot, a lot of Certainly. The most important concept here is the concept of defense in depth, that there's no one tool, no one security measure that solves the, the security challenge. Um, just as in a physical building, you have multiple layers of security, a fence, guards, cameras, locks on doors. You have to have the same in cybersecurity. Um, Einstein um, is, is that perimeter system. It's the fence and the guard houses and the cameras around the perimeter of the government. Um, it's equally important that you have security on the inside. Um, agencies have to do most of that internal security based upon their unique needs and missions, but continuous diagnostics and mitigation um, is a program we have to help agencies with that, where we are buying capabilities on behalf of those agencies. Um, they choose from a menu that suits them and roll it out, and those capabilities will come in three phases. The first phase is the equivalent um, of a guard that goes around and checks that all the buildings are locked, that all the doors and windows are closed, um, basic security measures that make sure that they're in place. The second phase of CDM uh, opens the door to the buildings and checks who's on the inside. Does that person, are they authorized to be in this building? Are they doing things that they're permitted to be doing? And then the third phase is like a very smart security guard that goes around and just says, hey, I see something unusual, we need to look at that because that that behavior, that thing I see inside this facility, that doesn't belong here. Those are the three phases of CDM looking inside the building. Einstein, which is that perimeter, the first phase was just a camera. Here's the cars coming in and out, record the cars. If there's an unusually large number of cars, set off an alarm. The second phase added a watch list. Hey, you know, 
this particular blue car is not supposed to enter this facility, set off an alarm. The third phase, which we are currently rolling out, is like a gate. It's a guardhouse and a gate. The gate stops the malicious car from entering the facility, but the other great thing is because it's a guardhouse, we can add different security capabilities to it. We can add new cameras, we can add new gates, additional guards. It's a platform that we can add new capabilities to over time. So while we're first focused on rolling it out across the government and building that first gate, we're also looking to the future and saying, what other capabilities can we add to this guardhouse? Excellent explanation. Thank you so much. Senator Langford. Thank you. Uh, thanks for all your preparation and being here. I know this is not what you wanted to be able to do today. Uh, there's lots of other things you'd like to be able to do outside on a beautiful day like that than be in here with us. Uh, but we've got a lot of things to be able to deal with in the days ahead on this. Um, Mr. Archuleta, let me, let me clarify a couple of things with you. Uh, you've made the statement about uh, the first intrusion, second intrusion, and the 4.2 is from the first intrusion. So just to clarify, none of the letters that have gone out have been connected to the breach dealing with the background securities. So the letters that went out, all of them are related to the first breach. None of those letters were related to the second. That's correct, sir. Okay. The, um, you, you and I had an interaction just a, a couple of days ago, and we were talking about uh, the development of the plan. At that time, I, by the way, I'd mentioned to you, I, we'd sent you a letter from the subcommittee that I chair on this committee, and your staff has been very prompt to be able to get back to us on that. I appreciate that, uh, to be able to get back on those details. Uh, one of the questions I'd asked about was the cybersecurity plan development. And you mentioned your CIO and your CTO had led the effort to put this together. But one thing I'm going to need clarification on among several, and we'll reply back to you formally on this, uh, is the, the contractor that was the advisor, or was there an outside advisor to the CIO and CTO when they were putting the, uh, the cyber plan, or did they completely put that plan together in-house? No, our plan was, uh, was uh, developed in-house. The okay. IT security plan was, uh, the IT uh, implementation plan is, was built in-house. Okay. Uh, also, in our interaction uh, from a couple of days, days ago, I'd asked about <clears throat> the, uh, the statement that's been made about author, authorizing systems. There are 47 total systems that are out there. Uh, that There were 11 systems that were reported and not authorized at that point. You said no, 10 of those have been authorized. There's one of them that's an outside contract that hasn't. From the IG's testimony today, I noticed the statement, in April, the CIO issued a memorandum that granted an extension of the previous authorizations for all systems whose authorization had already expired and for those scheduled to expire through uh, September 2016. Should this memorandum on authorizations continue, the agency will have up to 23 systems that have not been subject to a thorough security controls assessment. The justification for this action was that OPM is in the process of modernizing its IT infrastructure, and once this modernization is complete, all systems would have to receive new authorizations anyway. While we support uh, the CIO's effort to modernize its system, this action to extend authorizations is contrary to OMB guidance, which specifically states that an extended or interim authorization is not valid. Consequently, these systems are still operating without a current authorization, as they have not been subject to the complete security assessment process that the authorization memorandum is intended to represent. OMB does not require authorizations every three years. If the agency has a mature continuing monitoring program in place, our audit work has found that they do not. So the, the question is, the authorizations that are in place, are they done by fiat, basically of the agency saying we're working on this, or have they actually gone through the actual authorization process? We've worked very closely with OMB, and they're aware of the process that we're using on these authorizations, um, and that understanding where we are in the process of moving towards new systems. So we have complete concurrence with, with OMB on these authorizations. So we are in compliance, and we're working on the, th on the final one uh, that we noted uh, as rapidly as possible. So, so the question there on compliance is OMB has changed what their typical ruling is. There, are, there are circumstances uh, that allow us because of the situation that we're in in terms of migrating and because of the legacy of our systems, yes. Okay. Mr. McFarland, any comments on that at all? Or? Excuse me. It's not my understanding. My understanding is that what, what you just said, Senator, about the continuous monitoring, if it's mature, OPM does not have a mature continuous monitoring. Now, if OMB has made an exception, we haven't been notified of that. Okay, the, um, the, the very rapid 
path that you had to take uh, to deal with credit monitoring, to be able to notify and provide credit monitoring for 4 million people at this point had to come together very quickly. Uh, my understanding of the contracting on that, you put out on a Thursday, uh, gave two days and said anyone who wants to bid on this needs to have it finished by Saturday and to be able to get the bid in and then you let that out immediately the next week on that. Is that a, the contractor that was involved, is that someone that uh, OPM has used before or is familiar with, or how did this process come together that quickly? Because that's that's somebody mm -hmm. obviously pulling that together extremely fast. Um, the contracting office uh, does actually perform that function, and I, I the is the microphone on? I'm sorry, right there. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, sorry. Uh, the the contracting office actually does uh, uh, handle that process, and uh, on May 28th they posted the RFQ and they closed on. May 30th, and they did receive several responses. Uh, we worked first with the GS, uh, GSA list, and um, they the we found that there were were not vendors on that list that met the requirements that we needed, and that's why we moved rapidly. We wanted to be sure that we were able to notify individuals very, very quickly, and that's why we used a very rapid uh, turnaround. We also find that the companies that were the types of services we were at, we were looking for, those companies are used to that type of uh, timeline, and so that's why we were able to get the three responses that we did. I don't know what kind of feedback that you have had so far on this, and this is just one of those rolling, once, once things get hard, they just continue to get harder for a while. Uh, but the contractor in question that's handled this has dealt with numerous website crashes uh, from obviously 4 million people hitting their site and has not been able to sustain it. Even some of my own staff that have received the letter can't seem to get on their website and to be able to get going on the credit monitoring. Uh, so wh while the, the contractor that was placed in this uh, was fast in the turnaround, they don't seem to be able to sustain on the other side of it. Have you had any other input on that? Um, I'm very frustrated by sort of the initial steps that the the contractor uh, faced, and we are meeting with them on a daily basis to improve the services to our employees. Our employees deserve quick answers. They need to be get on a, on a website. If they don't, they should not, if they can't get to a, a call center, for example, employee, they shouldn't have to wait on the phone, and that's why we instituted a service similar to SSA where they're callbacks. We think it is uh, it has worked better, uh, but we have learned a lot from this. Um, and uh, we are noting very carefully uh, what the as we look at the next notifications, the, what areas we need to improve upon. The questions will be, every agency head across the entire federal family is going to want your notes from the past month. Uh, because the, the best thing that we can do is to be able to get our technology up to speed so that we have fewer instances like this, but also have preparation for when something actually occurs. Uh, so I hope you'll be able to share some of those very quickly written notes uh, because there's a lot that has to be put into place to be able to help clean this up. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Senator Sass. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Archuleta, uh, this is the fourth briefing, I believe, on this topic in the last week. Um, it's not surprising that new details keep coming out, but I think what's frustrating and confusing for many of us is that many core elements of the timeline have shifted over the week. So. I'd like to just walk through a basic timeline of events and have you help me understand if we have some of these facts correct. Uh, we heard in one setting this week that March 2014 is when OPM was first breached. That isn't accurate, is it? In March of 2014, there was uh, adversarial activity into the OPM network uh, that dated back to November 2013, and at no PII was lost during that. How was that uh, November 2013 breach detected and by whom? Um, we detected that uh, adversarial activity, and uh, it, we worked with uh, DHS on on the uh, forensics of that. Okay, Dr. Osmond, that's your understanding as well. It, certainly, I'll, I'll elaborate on the timeline if you don't mind, because it is quite confusing. Um, there was an incident in in 2014, March of 2014, um, at OPM. Um, DHS had received a tip from an interagency partner and, and reached out to OPM, and we worked together and, and found that intrusion, as the director noted. Um, and that intrusion dated from November of 2013. Um, we now, of course, have two incidents, or, or potentially two events that are the same incident. Uh, the terminology isn't great here. Currently. That's an important distinction, though, isn't it? Because the notifications, both to the Congress potentially to folks in the White House and ultimately to the, whatever the right number is, north of 
10, 10 million, uh, all those things will be implicated based on whether or not there were one or two events. Um, there are clearly two events right now. The Department of Interior data center that hosted the 4.2 million uh, OPM uh, personnel records and the, um, the breach at OPM itself where the analysis is still occurring to identify um, how much data was stolen. Um, I think the key distinction is, you know, who is the adversary and was it the same adversary in both cases? And for that, I would have to defer to law enforcement and intelligence to speak to that. Um, but, uh, you know, clearly two different locations, two different sets of data involved. Uh, in Thank you. Case. Uh, Director Archuleta, you said that the attackers, attackers got into OPM's networks through a credential that was given to a key point contract employee who was working on background investigations, correct? That's correct, sir. Um, at yesterday's hearing, we learned that no personally identifiable information was stolen in that breach, but blueprints for the mainframe were. Is that your understanding? I, I think we were talking about, um, I want to be sure which one. That was in the March of the 2014. I think that there's two different incidences. That so, were. but what was gotten in November of 2013? In November of, tw okay, I'm sorry, sir, I misunderstood the question, Thanks. I apologize. In, um, in, as I understand it, November of 2013, while no PII was lost, uh, there was an extraction of some manuals. Um, as Donna Seymour testified yesterday, um, as did uh, the representative from DHS, is that those manuals are common manuals that could be bought in a store. And what information was on the mainframe computers that they got the manuals to? I'd have to get back with you, sir, on that. I, I don't know exactly. I believe it's been reported that it was security clearance background invest information. Dr. Osmond, do you think that's correct? I would have to defer to OPM on that. Uh, it's been publicly reported um, that just a few months later, in June of 2014, uh, USIS, another OPM contractor working on security clearance investigations, reported that it had also been breached. Is that correct? Yes. And what was stolen from USIS? Uh, there was uh, OPM data impacting approximately uh, 2.6 uh, thousand uh, individuals. 2.6 thousand? Yes. And that was security clearance information, but it was on laptops? I believe, sir. I'd have to get back with you on that. Um, earlier this week, you were asked about a separate breach at Key Point, which was discovered in September of 2014. We believe in our office that that breach occurred in August of 2014 and that 49,000 security clearance holders' uh, records were breached. Do you think that's accurate? The adversarial activity dated back to December of 2013, sir. Okay, but didn't you just a minute ago say that the only thing captured in December, November and December of 2013 was the manuals? Sir, I, I can jump in and yeah, speak to that. Please. The, the, the first incident that uh, Director Archuleta is referring to is an incident that was detected in March of 2014 at OPM, and the activity at OPM that was detected in March of 2014 dated back to November of 2013. Separately, the activity at USIS, uh, a contractor to both OPM and DHS, um, dated dated back to April of 2013. Separately, the activity at Key Point uh, dated back to December of 2013. Okay, so in addition to that distinction, you said in your testimony that there was an October 2014 Interior Department uh, breach. Can you tell me what, was, what records were being housed at Interior? Uh, um, I would defer to OPM in general, but I, I can... It's the employee personnel records. So this is all non-security clearance information uh, from the, the interior four, breach? The 4.2, yes. Okay. And in December of 2014, what was the OPM breach in December? Uh, the, the breach that um, was to, uh, that started in, uh, apologies, uh, the, the most recent OPM investigation where um, they are, where OPM is still uh, ascertaining which background investigations were compromised was detected uh, in April, but the activity ran um, from May of 2014 through April, although the intruder was most active on the network from June of 2014 to January of 2015. 
I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to with the December of 2014 date, I'm afraid. Well, I'm trying to confirm that there were security clearance background investigations in that breach as well. I think one of the reasons we care about this is because in March of 2014's breach, we've been told that blueprints to the mainframe were all that were stolen. Um, and then that same mainframe, I believe, was hacked in December of 2014. And if that's true, I'm wondering if any systems that didn't have the manuals taken were actually hacked with secure background investigation in December of 2014. If not, calling these mere manuals isn't accurate. Can uh, we get that information back to you in a full list, sir? Sure. So that would describe it? We have uh, about a 10-page letter to you on Monday, and so we'd be grateful for info to that we'll, being added to that response as well. We're actively responding, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I have more questions, but I'll wait till the second round if the okay. chairman wants to go first. Thanks, Senator Sass. Um, Dr. Osmond, uh, <laughs> based on Senator Sass's questions, I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of activity. You know, you combine the IG reports that have been showing the 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 lack of security or the, the material uh, problems with security, um, just trying to get this all straight. It, it's difficult. Is it true uh, that DHS did write a mitigation plan based on that November 2013 attack? Uh, yes, Senator. When DHS's incident response team goes on site to any incident, as part of their report out of that incident, they say, here are some of the uh, steps that we recommend that an agency take to bolster its defenses. It's not a complete plan. It's not a, you know, ground up look at a, a network. It's based on what we saw in our time here. We recommend that you make the following changes. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure our committee has access to that plan. So can you uh, provide that to the committee, please? Uh, I'll take that back, sir. Appreciate that. Uh, rather than start a second round right away, I'll just uh, defer to Senator Portman for your first round. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having this hearing. It's been uh, very helpful, I think, for all of us to have an exchange of information. It's also been very troubling, to be frank with you. And, um, you know, one of my concerns from the start of this has been uh, about the nature of the information that these hackers have received, and specifically uh, information that is very sensitive that, um, as was mentioned earlier in the panel, the SF-86 is a form that you have to fill out to get a security clearance, and it includes highly confidential information, uh, mental health history, uh, issues about your personal life, and so on, that in the wrong hands can be very damaging, not just to that individual, but also to our national security. And so one of the concerns that I'd like to raise with you today is uh, the extent to which this information you believe might be in the hands of our adversaries. Um, and specifically, uh, you know, what are we going to do about that? Um, I, I realize that uh, there's some sensitive matters here being discussed, but I think this has all been sort of out in the public. And if there's something you believe uh, shouldn't be discussed in this setting, uh, I know the chairman is very eager to get this information also. We'd be happy to talk to you about it in a, in a more classified setting. So my first question, Dr. Osmond, is to you. Um, are we any closer to knowing what the scope of information was that's been accessed on this uh, Federal Investigative Service Systems? Was it the SF-86 forms? Was it investigatory notes uh, and supporting documents? Uh, they're also part of background information. Um, and um, tell us what we know about that. Senator Portman, I'll, I'll start the answer to that question. And with your permission, I'll, I'll ask uh, Director Archuleta to complete it. Um, Anytime you're trying to assess the impact of an intrusion, um, you have two activities that have to take place. First, the forensics investigators have to figure out essentially where did the adversary go, what did they have access to, and what did they do with the information they had access to. And you are rarely working with full evidence. If you think about a, a physical crime scene, you're looking for fingerprints, you're looking, you know, did somebody leave a half-smoked mm -hmm. cigarette? You know, you're looking for clues, and that's what our forensics investigators are doing. It takes time, and sophisticated adversaries try to erase their tracks. They wear gloves so they don't leave fingerprints, and that is definitely the case here. So, so what do um, we know? So what we know is um, we continue to look at systems and see where were the adversaries um, you know, were they on this system? We then have to, to work with OPM, and, and OPM has to say, this is what was on the system. 
which means that you know, we can say the adversary was here, they have to be able to say this is what was on the system. And I'll, I'll ask Director Archuleta to speak to that. I'm glad to speak to that. Um, on uh, early June, uh, our forensics teams uh, advised uh, the interagency, uh, um, well, they advised me, I'll just say that. They advised me that um, there was a high confidence that the background investigation records had been compromised. Okay, let me ask you another question, Dr. Osman. There has been some discussion regarding whether these adversaries might have manipulated data uh, in the background investigation databases that we've just heard from the director. Um, she has high confidence that those have been breached. They could have actually manipulated data in our federal government systems with regard to these background investigations. Uh, for example, to change the outcome of a clearance adjudication, uh, remove derogatory information, maybe add derogatory information. Um, can you tell us anything about that possibility? Um, sir, I, I can speak uh, broadly. The adversary did have the type of access that could allow them to change information. Um, I, I cannot speak to whether that, you know, a change of information would allow them to, to do any of the things that you specifically suggested there. Um, I will possible? say. Is it possible? Uh, it is possible to change information. The implications of that I, I can't speak to. I will say, and I don't want to speak for my intelligence community colleagues, but I'll, I'll repeat what they said in a, a prior session, which is. Um, and law enforcement colleagues, which is they view that as unlikely. Is it possible that uh, adversaries responsible for the breaches um, have also manipulated the data in the background investigation database itself? I can say that the, the adversaries had the type of access that would allow them to manipulate uh, some types of data. Um, I don't know specifically what was on the databases. Mm -hmm that they had access to, I'd have to defer to OPM for that. Yeah. Um, Director Archuleta, one thing we talked earlier is why we haven't responded more quickly. When did you first learn about these breaches? Uh, we were notified of the breach that you're describing. Um, we, uh, the first breach occurred, uh, I'll talk about both incidents. The first breach occurred uh, in April. And, April of uh, this year. April of this year. And uh, we were notified of the high, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we were, we were notified of the second breach, the high probability of extraction uh, or exposure on, in June. So these background investigations we're talking about here, the highly sensitive information we've known since June. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. We didn't know before that? OK. No, sir. Um, we talked earlier about you're not having met with the director of the FBI despite these incredible discrepancies in the information we're receiving from the two agencies. So I would, I would hope the conclusion there is that you all are going to get um, one story for the American people. My constituents want to know, um, including the 10 million people who are wondering. Um, have you met with the Secretary of Defense or the Director of National Intelligence about this breach in the background information database and the potential impact it could have on their employees? I have not met with them personally, no. Um, I, w I would think that would be another obvious thing to do. I mean, my concern, again, was the concern I think every American should share, which is the most sensitive information in the most important national security agencies has now potentially been compromised. Um, and I would hope that the FBI director who leads our counterintelligence efforts as well as uh, Secretary of Defense and DNI would, uh, would, would be involved in this effort. Um, May I just say that because I haven't met with him does not mean that they're not engaged in this effort um, on the, the intelligence community issues uh, are issues I know that they're meeting about, but those are not issues uh, as I am on the personnel records that uh, I'm included in, but I do know that there have been um, meetings about that with them. Uh, one final question, and this just sort of comes to me as we've been listening today to the testimony, you know, who should have this information, the most sensitive information we talked about. Department of Defense used to have it. Um, OPM has it now. Clearly with these breaches, uh, this should be revisited. So I would ask you, uh, Mr. Scott, uh, do you believe the Department of Defense is a better place to have this sensitive information? Are they better prepared to handle it? Um, I, I'm, I have to 
say, uh, Senator, I'm fairly new to the federal government. I don't have a comprehensive view at this particular point. This 30-day this sprint that we're doing will look across a wide range of policy, practice, organization, resourcing, and a number of other things. And that certainly we can put on our list of something to uh, uh, come back with. A, the Federal uh, Investigative uh, Services uh, is a specific area, uh, Mr. Scott, where we would appreciate your input as to where you think that ought to reside. I don't know if uh, you, Mr. Osmond, or you, uh, Ms. Archuleta, have thoughts on that. As, um, over, uh, as, a, as a suitability agent, I work very closely with our security agent and OMB to really discuss the improvements that need to be made throughout the federal ba investigative uh, background, and we've been working on that together um, and uh, take very seriously that responsibility. I think we do a good job at this. And uh, because we do work very closely uh, with our partners on it, especially with DOD, uh, to make sure that they're getting the type of background investigations in the quality and the timeliness that they deserve. And we are working very hard at that and making improvements uh, all the time to be sure that we're delivering the product they deserve. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you, Senator Portman. Uh, I, I just want to kind of get the timeline straight on these breaches we're talking about, their subject. To this hearing. Um, the breach that involved uh, personnel information occurred in December of 2014 and discovered in April of this year, about four months later. Is, is that correct, D Director Archuleta? Yes, sir. And the breach that involved all of the background information, per uh, this very sensitive national security background information, uh, that occurred a year, a year ago in June of 2014 and basically took 12 months to discover. And, and that was actually discovered because we implemented some, is it dual authentication process and, and we actually prevented them from, from continuing to, to ex, exfiltrate the information? Uh, sir, if you will, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, recapitulate the full set of dates because I think you're right, it is extremely important. Um, the Department of Interior Data Center, um, and as you know, the investigation on all of these continues, so we mm -hmm. learn new information all the time. The uh, all of these were discovered due to the April 2015 discovery. So OPM rolled out new security technologies as they had been rolling out new sec security technologies, detected an intrusion on, on their networks in April of 2015. They gave DHS the cyber threat indicators, uh, similar to what's being discussed in information sharing legislation. We used those and identified the breach at the Department of Interior. The breach at the Department of Interior, the adversary was on the network of the Department of Interior from October of 2014 through April of 2015. Specific pieces of data were removed in December of 2014. So that's where the December date is coming out. But looking at the whole range of when the adversary was on the network, it was October 2014 through April 2015. Um, and I would encourage you to think about that as the most relevant time frame. Okay. Um, at OPM itself, um, there are really two key time frames. The time frame when the adversary was on the network, which was May of 2014 to April of 2015. Um, but the time that the adversary was, was essentially active on the network was only June of 2014 through January of 2015. OPM rolled out um, a security control in January of 2015 that stopped the adversary um, from taking further significant action, but it didn't detect the adversary. So it the adversary was largely stopped in January, but not detected until an additional control was rolled out in April. Okay, and then again, so we, we found out in mid-April and we announced this on June 4th. I mean, the, uh, the, pub the public became aware of this on June 4th. So in, in mid-April, we discovered that the adversary was on the network, but not what they had done. And so we, we then commenced the forensics work. The forensics work reached a um, high confidence level more rapidly at the Department of Interior. So the Department of Interior, they more rapidly uh, finished the forensics or, or largely finished the forensics investigation and were able to conclude okay. the breach. So again, so I understand that takes time. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Scott, you, in, in your uh, role within OMB as the, the federal government's chief information officer. You did announce the cybersecurity sprint last week. 
Uh, I realize you're relatively new in the role, starting in February, and uh, you, you, we're not going to solve these problems overnight. I got that. Uh, why didn't we announce a, a, a more robust effort right off the bat, basically in April? Um, it, so we formed a eGov cyber unit uh, late last year um, in my office, uh, put that team together, worked closely with uh, DHS and so on. Um, and I began with that team to look at the cross-government data. Some of the elements of what we announced in the sprint, uh, we actually started before the full sprint was okay. announced. Uh, so it, it's been an escalating uh, set of activities. So again, you, you've uh, expressed a fair amount of confidence in uh, Director Archuleta and, and her team to, to uh, fix this. But again, I, I go back to the Federal Information Security Management Act audits. Uh, and and this, you know, even in fiscal year 2009, uh, in that audit, first page of the executive summary says the lack of policies and procedures was reported as a material weakness in fiscal year FY 2007, fiscal year 2008. Um, the weakness in our government security systems has been known for a long time. Uh, I understand it's going to, you know, you don't solve these problems overnight. I understand that uh, Director Archuleta is been in the office about 18 months. But certainly, having been a manager in the private sector myself, again, I don't expect perfection. Uh, I understand the problems are, you know, difficult to solve. But I'm looking for people to prioritize. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at people's actions that they took. And the fact that the director did not meet with the inspector general to specifically discuss these IG reports, the, the fact that she did not, she has not yet met with FBI Director Comey on, this, on, on these very serious issues really, really gives me pretty great pause in terms of having confidence that the current management team in OPM re really are up, is up to the task. Do you, do you disagree with that? I mean, do you really have that great a confidence? Um, my Again, com you, you are the gov federal government's chief information officer. Do you really have confidence in the management team of OPM that they're going to be able to solve this problem when they've shown such a lack of attention and priority to, to this issue? And, and let's face it, a record of failure now. Well, uh, Senator, I think there's uh, several bits of evidence I can go back to, many of which you've mentioned here. But the history going back to 2009 and 10 shows that there's been a historical set of issues there. If I look at in OPM and elsewhere where progress has been made, I can see a delineation point from when Director Archuleta took place and recruited Donna Seymour into that role, where there's dramatic difference in terms of the actions that not only were planned, but then uh, began execution. And I worry in this particular case that as we deploy more tools uh, across the federal government, and as we are likely to discover more of these kinds of issues, that there's a chilling effect on anybody wanting to come in and take one of these no, roles I, I, I understand. and do I, that, the hard work. And, and again, and that, that is a real problem, you know, and I appreciate that you're willing to exit, you know, the private sector and, you know, with your expertise and bring that to, to bear in terms of services nation. But again, here's my problem, a flash audit on a, you know, on the infrastructure improvement project with the final conclusion is, in our opinion, according to the Inspector General, the project management approach for this major infrastructure overhaul is entirely, entirely inadequate and introduces a very high risk of project failure. That doesn't give me much confidence in, in the management team that's implementing that. I mean, Inspector General McFarland, I mean, do you, do you have confidence in, you know, based on, on your audits, on the work you've done, do you have confidence in, in OPM's current management to, to really follow through on this and provide the security I think this nation deserves? I, b I believe that the uh, interest and the uh, intent is there, but, but based, based on what we've found, no. I have no further questions. Uh, Senator Ayotte. Um, thank you. I, I wanted to ask uh, about uh, one of my staff members received a letter from OPM, and as I understand it, in the letter, um, she was asked by a third-party contractor um, to produce information on her credit card and bank accounts, and she was also not told about the IRS's um, 
IP PIN program, which we've spent some time on in this committee, which allows uh, taxpayers who are victims of identity theft or potential victims to protect themselves. So um, I, I was kind of troubled when I learned that this morning from her, just because here we have a situation where all of these records have been breached. And if our solution is to ask people to submit additional very personal information on credit card bank records that you would then, your, either you or your third party contractor would be holding rather than working with potential um, victims of this to you know, have them seek the proper mechanism with the credit reporting agencies. Uh, so can you help me understand this and why you think this is a good approach? Because uh, <coughs> let's face it, the fact that we are where we are with all these records that uh, have now been breached, uh, I don't think people should feel real confident at the moment of giving you additional information or a contractor working with, with the government on this. Um, to my knowledge, Senator, we're not asking, and so I'd like to talk to your, your uh, we're not asking for that information, so I would like to talk to your staff member to find out exactly what conversation or what information she got, because uh, the registration for the credit monitoring is an action that the, each individual takes. So I'd be glad to talk to her. I'd that like would be very great. Much, I, I hope she's very not already like, being, you know, her information trying, identity yeah, very much already like trying to manipulate this because yeah. when she told me that this morning, my jaw dropped. Um, and so I want to understand uh, why uh, OPM isn't using encryption or what steps are being taken to, bet to better use encryption of people's information given the breadth of personal information that OPM is maintaining on so many of the people in this country? Uh, certainly. Um, I wish that, uh, that we, our systems, uh, all of our systems were, enabled to, were uh, able to um, be fitted with the encryption tools. Uh, but we have an older legacy system, on, and uh, there are certain op applications that it would not. Uh, we would not be able to use encryption. And uh, as uh, Dr. Osmond will say, that the encryption uh, is, in fact, would not have uh, prevented this incident. Um, that's an important fact. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't move forward to indeed uh, apply encryption wherever we can. And we're moving forward with that, as well as using more uh, um, modern tools, such as uh, masking and the hiding of a redacting of information when it's not needed? Well, does uh, encryption is one, one tool in the toolbox. And does OPM employ a layered approach at all? Because obviously layering <coughs> is something that is important when you're looking at um, making sure that there are different ways that information is protected uh, as a multi verification process versus uh, one, relying on one tool in the toolbox. Right, I, I would have to get back with you, Senator, to be sure that I, uh, that I can give you that full information. Well, that would be very important, I think, because um, t to me, uh, the fact that many of the tools that seem to be lacking in the use here um, are already being engaged in the private sector, uh, yet we, you know, the, the type of personal information that is being held um, by an agency like OPM is just staggering in terms of what we're hearing about the breadth of this breach. So I would, I would like a, a follow-up um, on, on that question. Um, one thing that, that I want to understand is that in January, um, OPM began utilizing this two-factor authentication approach and incidentally and unknowingly ended the intrusion into the data system containing security and clearance information. Um, do you believe that had this been in place to begin with, the intrusion would not have been able to happen in the first place? I would have to ask um, Dr. Osmond on the, more on the forensic side for that, but I know that we are have moved very rapidly to uh, increase the percentage of unprivileged users with two-factor uh, strong uh, two-factor authentication. We're also for remote users have uh, have a hundred percent. I'm sorry that for we have uh, requiring a, a two-factor authentication for all remote users. 
And one of the things that I um, had asked you about with my staff member when I told you the information she had received and we and touched upon in the beginning was something we heard a lot of testimony in this committee on from the IRS commissioner uh, because unfortunately the IRS has been uh, breached as well and they have this IRS IP PIN program. It strikes me that given the type of information that has been breached in this that uh, the victims of this theft can very much expect that they could likely be victims of tax fraud going forward. So what steps are you taking to ensure that these victims have access and are enrolled in the IRS IP PIN program to ensure that we aren't having another hearing on, um, I, I, I suppose, potentially millions of individuals who now find themselves to be uh, victims of tax fraud as well? I'll ask my uh, colleague, Tony Scott, to talk about that. I'm not familiar with the IRS. Yeah, the, the PIN program is actually designed to do a different thing, as I understand it, than would be the use case uh, for OPM. Um, and, but, but I can answer some of the question that you asked the director. They do have a multi-layered uh, approach. But, to but Tony, oh, excuse me, I'm yes. sorry, Mr. Scott. But let me just say, um, what the IRS, what I'm trying to say is this, is that we know all this personal information has been breached. People are going to be, that are the victims of this, will be filing their tax returns. If they are enrolled in the IRS PIN program, people can't just file the tax re return. They are then right. given a PIN at their physical address, so therefore the identity thieves can't then use uh, this information to then victimize them on the IRS end. And this would be something, if, if I were a victim of this, that I would want to have put in place right away because this could protect me from potential tax fraud because of the extra step that has to be taken. So are, are, how are we working this with the IRS to make sure these victims have access to this program? Because this is a very large problem right now. Sure. I'm sorry. I misunderstood your question initially. So um, we, we will look at this cross-agency, not just at the IRS, but anywhere else citizens need to interact with the federal government as part of our longer-term recommendation. So um, forgive me, my time is up, but I think looking at it is probably insufficient given how devastating this type of um, use of people's personal information can be. And I, I think that we can't just look at it. I think we've got to come up with a plan to give uh, the people who have been victimized the opportunity to be part of this program so they then aren't further victimized by becoming victims of tax fraud. Thank you. Senator Sass. Uh, Director Archuleta, here's where I think we are. I think this morning we've heard of a timeline that shows attackers persistently coming after uh, confidential personnel and background investigation and OB OPM being caught flat-footed for up to 19 months. Um, has any malware been detected on OPM's network since June 8th when the intrusion into security clearance databases was discovered? Uh, not to my no – we are unaware of any <clears throat> at this time. Given how long it took OPM to detect the attacks, how can we know that the attacks are over? We work very closely with our cybersecurity experts throughout government, working closely not only with DHS but FBI um, and, uh, and their hunt teams. So we're constantly monitoring our systems. But couldn't you have given that same answer in March and it would have been wrong? As we have developed and installed new security systems uh, in March um, of 2013, or 2014? Uh, uh, March of 2015, you didn't have information. You hadn't discovered these attacks that were then ongoing. We have been working very hard, sir, to put in place all of the security measures. And I think if in my, in my plan there's a, a long list of things that we have done and been able to do. We need more resources to get that done, and we, that's why we've come to Congress to ask for them. I, I want to go to Dr. Osment in a minute, but if I can translate, I think, uh, Director Archuleta, I'm, I'm saying. I, I'm sorry. You, you, said, we, you said you're trying hard. That's different than having knowledge that the attacks are over. So we, we, we um, combat over 10 million attempts in a month. And so we're working very hard 
Um, I can describe to you each of the things that we've done. That's why I gave you the paper this morning so that I that you would have that. Uh, we've worked very hard to do that, not just at OPM, but with all of our colleagues. Cybersecurity is an enterprise endeavor, and that's why we work with Tony and Andy and our colleagues at, N at FBI and NSA. We do work with them on this. We are combating a very aggressive, a very well-funded, and a very focused Perpetrators. I, I agree uh, that we're we're, attack, we're dealing with persistent attackers, but I think you didn't say that you have certainty that the attacks are over. Dr. Osment, do you believe the attacks are over and that we know that with certainty? Uh, <clears throat> I spend a lot of time with both government and private sector cybersecurity experts, and I don't think any cybersecurity expert I know would ever say that we can be certain that we have blocked all intruders who are trying to get into our networks. Um, and I think that is a state of the world that we're living in right now. It is not a condition unique to OPM. Um, that is a, a universal truth um, for cybersecurity. Uh, Mr. Scott, has the malware that was found at OPM been discovered on any other agencies' networks? Um, I think it's a better question for Andy, um, but the way it works is these indicators of compromise DHS has, and then they circulate to all the other agencies. And part of our cyber sprint, we've ask agencies to go back and take a look at those. So um, this, is, this is not, not a blame allocation right. question and not meant to be right. hostile, but isn't your title senior to his? Help us understand what your role is, if that's a question for Dr. Osmond. It, it's really ours is more policy and guidance. Um, DHS has the operational response uh, uh, responsibility in the cyber framework. And, sir, I can tell you that we have, as uh, Mr. Scott highlighted, shared these indicators to departments and agencies. We have had at least one department think that they had an intrusion, but after further forensics, um, it turned out not to be the case. So, but we, we continue to, um, you know, ask agencies to keep using these indicators, keep looking to see if they see uh, activity on their networks. And as, of course, <clears throat> if anything comes up, we work with the agency to investigate it. But we have not confirmed anything additional since, uh, other than this Department of Interior Data Center and OPM itself. So would that mean that any other known federal intrusions would be visible to this committee? Are there any other cyber attacks against the federal government that have not been disclosed to this committee? Um, the uh, FISMA 2014 legislation imposed requirements for notifying the Congress on cyber intrusions and attacks. Um, to my knowledge, any intrusion and attack that, that would fall into those uh, requirements has been notified to you. There is a constant low level of activity across the government, um, you know, where, where sort of the, the noise of the internet uh, occurs. You know, you have uh, low level criminal malware. Um, I don't know that that is, I would not expect that that is required to be reported and is not reported, but the significant activity that is covered by FISMA 2014, to my knowledge, all of that has been reported to the Congress. Thank you. I'd like to go back to uh, Senator Portman's line of questioning about the SF-86. Um, Director Archuleta, there have been many summaries of where we are uh, in this attack in the media that have likened this to the Target or the Home Depot attack, which is where credit card information was stored. Obviously, we're talking about something much more serious than that. I want to quote from the SF-86 for a second. In addition to the questions on this form, this inquiry also is made about your adherence to security requirements, honesty and integrity, vulnerability to exploitation or coercion, falsification, misrepresentation, and any other behavior activities or associations that tend to demonstrate a person is not uh, reliable, trustworthy, and loyal. Um, as those of us who've been through top secret background investigations know, they ask lots of questions about sexual history, uh, relationships, associations, anything that could lead an individual to be coerced or blackmailed. Can you help us understand uh, why this information would have been stored on OPM networks to begin with? Um, it's part of the background investigation that uh, we do for the clearances uh, at very high levels for classified positions, and uh, that is part of the uh, determination for 
uh, the actual, uh, that's the adjudication information. Uh, what, one of the things that uh, is important is that uh, in understanding the scope of this breach is to really understand how that data was sort, how that data was saved. So I want to be sure, again, as I go back to my opening statement, is that, that we're looking at all of these files to see how that data was stored and sort of the uh, impact and scope of, uh, of that breach. And that's why we're taking a, a much more careful time to do so. In the sexual history kinds of questioning, uh, if people named other parties, would those have been in this information? It really is relying on the, uh, I, don't, I actually don't know what is stored in which files. I'd be glad to get that to you to give you a description. Um, I believe that, again, it's how that, in, that information is stored and how, what access uh, the breach had to that. Dr. Osmond, do you think that narrative history would be stored? I can't speak to the contents of the databases. Uh, I think I need to yield to Mr. Carper. I have more questions, but I'll wait. Senator Carper. Thanks. So thank you for yielding. Um, and again, thank you all for being here. I know you've been here for quite a while, and uh, we're grateful for your presence and your answers to, uh, to our questions. Uh, uh, General McFarland, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to come back in, in a minute, and uh, maybe not right now, but in a minute I'm going to ask you to come back. You shared a cautionary note with us about rushing, rushing and maybe uh, rushing so fast to you know, try to address these problems, fix this problem, that we actually waste money. And you signed sound as a cautionary note. Uh, why don't you just go ahead and sound that cautionary note again. What, what did you say right at the end of your, of your testimony, please? Because we want to move with great dispatch. And usually that's good, maybe not always, but you gave us a, some advice that I thought was, was probably worth repeating. What did you say? Excuse me. Thank you. I said it may sound counterintuitive, but OPM must slow down and not continue to barrel forward with this project. The agency must take the time to get it right the first time to determine the scope of the project, calculate the costs, and make a clear plan about how to implement this massive overhaul. OPM cannot afford to have the project fail. Thank you. Mm -hmm. the, um, I mentioned earlier uh, at least four uh, legislative steps that we took last year to bolster DHS and their, their, uh, their ability to fend off uh, for the government uh, writ large. Uh, see cyber attacks. The, uh, the passage of the uh, Federal Information Security uh, uh, Modernization Act, the uh, workforce capabilities, strengthening the workforce capabilities at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, strengthening uh, and making real the uh, op center for the Department of Homeland Security, and also the passage of uh, FATARA, the Federal Information Technology and Acquisition Reform Act. I think in your testimony here and other hearings we've had, almost everybody says those were the right things to do. I'm not sure we're fully implementing them as quickly as we need to, but, but at least I think on that, on that front, we've done our job. And uh, we're going to do oversight to make sure that, that the implementation is being done in a, an appropriate and, and expeditious way. Give us our to-do list. Give us a very brief to-do list. There's some things that we, on the heels of what we've done legislatively, what we need to do. What do we need to do next? And just very briefly, uh, uh, Director. Very briefly. Yes, and, and as I do that, I'd like to clarify uh, perhaps a statement that the IG made in terms of the additional resources answer that he responded to. We requested $21 million in the President's fiscal year 16 budget, but we're currently reevaluating uh, fiscal year uh, 16 IT modernization needs in light of these developments, and so uh, we would appreciate the Senate support. And as I said, we'll get back to you with that number. All right, thanks. Mr. Scott, give us a, a one, one thing we ought to be on the top of our to-do list. Sure. Um, I have four very quickly. The okay. first one is pass the administration's proposal for information sharing with the pi private sector. That will help everybody. It will help the nation. Second, I, I actually introduced uh, with a slight modification the administration's proposal, and hopefully we can get that done. God knows we need to. Okay. Thank you. Second one is um, don't allow us exceptions to the FATARA rule. Uh, that legislates good governance and good practice uh, and, and helps make the CIO fully accountable in each agency. Okay. We'll have recommendations coming out of our sprint, and I'm sure there'll be a reallocation of resource and, and priority as a result of those recommendations. All right, thanks. Um, Dr. Osmond? 
I would second Mr. Scott's highlighting of cybersecurity uh, threat indicator sharing legislation. I would also really emphasize the importance of passing authorizing legislation for Einstein. Um, as, as you know, it played a key role in this incident, and it's an important layer in our layers of defense. Um, and one of the impediments has been that some agencies are concerned that existing legislation impedes their ability uh, to work with us on Einstein. So your clarification of that would be greatly appreciated. All right, thanks. Mr. McFarland, uh, General, give, give us uh, one, one more thing to put at the top of our to-do to -do list. These are helpful ideas. I would, I would think that it would be very helpful if uh, Fatara and FISMA had, some, had more teeth to it from OMB's perspective. And instead of getting lists of who's doing this or who's doing that, who's delinquent, how far are they delinquent, there'd, there'd be some accountability against, against people. Good. Uh, Mr. Scott, would you re respond to that, please? Um, I think those are good recommendations, uh, Senator. OK. Um, Given what uh, we all know about the OPM breach, um, can each of you talk about some of the lessons learned? Kind of looking back, we all better uh, being Monday morning quarterbacks, but some of the lessons learned are the best practices that we should be incorporating across the, across the government. Um, and why haven't we already taken uh, these steps at, at some of the other agencies? Uh, do you want to go first on that, Mr. Scott? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, some of the early uh, things, and this also leverages my experience in the private sector. If you look at where the money has gone and where most of the effort has gone, it's been in prevent the cyber attack uh, from occurring in the first place. Even with multi-layered uh, approaches, most of that has been on prevention. But it's very clear with these persistent adversaries that some things are going to get through. They're just nasty and they keep coming at you. And you're always going to have, at some point, somebody getting through. And so as a nation, and especially as a federal government, we also have to invest in technology that, that allow us to quickly detect much more rapidly than we have been when there is a breach, then contain, and then quickly remediate. Um, and so some of our recommendations are likely to be in those areas where We've underinvested, even in a history of underinvestment in cyber more broadly. Mm -hmm. Dr. Osmond, same question, just uh, briefly, if you would. I would just second what Mr. Scott said. Well, that was a short answer. Um, last thing I'd say to is to go back to my, my friend, uh, Senator Sass. The uh, question is is this going to be the last attack? We all know it's not. Uh, will it be the last attack if this is from the Chinese? Uh, or some other uh, source, we know it's not. And uh, one of the takeaways for me here today is uh, this is an all hands on deck moment. We all have a responsibility. This is a shared responsibility. You have yours, we have ours. And we need to not just point fingers at one another, but to actually uh, figure out how to join hands and, and be a, a team uh, and, uh, in this all hands on deck moment. And you have my pledge to do that. And uh, we're, we're going to bring our best efforts to bear. And we need for you to do that as well. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Carper. Before I close out the hearing by giving the uh, witnesses one last opportunity to, to make a closing comment, I'd like to uh, throw it over to Senator Sass. You said you wanted to, if you have, if you have another quick question or two. If I can just take three minutes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, following up on what uh, Senator Carper just said, Mr. Scott, did OMB give OPM permission to operate with proper, without proper cybersecurity protections? Um, I'm not aware of any either giving or denying permission in that particular case. Uh, what we are doing is revising our guidelines. There was a every three-year um, authorization thing earlier, and that's uh, under uh, review right now. And we did issue uh, guidance that allowed for more continuous um, uh, authorization versus a three-year. But uh, that is subject to revision. Thank you. Dr. Osment, um, did you understand, you're now being brought in to help clean up this matter from DHS, but did DHS understand OPM's vulnerabilities prior to them being breached? Um, one of DHS and my organization's roles is to um, help compile the annual FISMA report to Congress. Um, 
some of which we, we were handed today or presented today. Um, as part of that, we compile agency self-reported information on their cybersecurity. Um, and all agencies have vulnerabilities, just as all companies have vulnerabilities. Um, uh, to my knowledge, we weren't aware of any specific vulnerabilities that were relevant to this incident, but um, we are generally aware that all agencies need to make additional progress on cybersecurity. But, but given some of the specific vulnerabilities at OPM, do you believe that OPM was fully honest about its problems with DHS leading up to the breach? Uh, to my knowledge, yes. Um, I'll close with this last question. The uh, Inspector General has criticized OPM for operating a, quote, decentralized system of cybersecurity because it created unique vulnerabilities. Could you explain what that means and tell us if you think any other agencies are currently operating with similarly decentralized systems? Dr. Osmond, I mean it for you, but I didn't know the Inspector General leveled the criticism, but I'm curious as to whether or not you think other agencies have the same vulnerability. I'm sorry, would you repeat the entire question? I apologize. You bet. Uh, the Inspector General has criticized OPM for operating with a decentralized system of cybersecurity, which created some unique vulnerabilities. One, I wonder if you can translate what that means, and two, I wonder if you think any other agencies have the same decentralized system. Uh, thank you. Um, I absolutely believe that um, it is very difficult for an agency to secure themselves if their CIO and CISO at the agency level are not empowered. Um, I know that that um, is a concern that in part prompted, in fact, the FITARA legislation. And I think that is the crux of the matter, is if they are not sufficiently empowered, if IT authority is decentralized within the agency, um, it's extremely difficult for that agency to secure itself. I think that means you think that many agencies have the same problem. I think there are other agencies that need to make progress in that area, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Senator Sass. Again, I'd like to offer the witnesses one last opportunity. If you have a, a closing thought or comment, I'm happy to do it. We'll start with you, uh, Madam Director. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to clarify uh, earlier comments to Senator McCain about the 18 million number. 18 million reference to preliminary approximate number of unique social security numbers. It comes from one of the compromised systems. Uh, however, it's incomplete and it does not provide accurate picture of the final number and it is one system among several and the number has not been cross-checked cross -checked against the other relevant systems. Um, in closing, I would state that again, we are reevaluating our fiscal year 16 needs. We are not seeking a fiscal year 15 supplemental. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Scott. Uh, thanks for having us today. I look forward to coming back to the committee with our recommendations at the end of the 30-day uh, sprint period and would love to engage in a further conversation with you at that point. Thank you. Dr. Osment. Thank you. <clears throat> Upon reflection, I'd like to add to my answer to Senator Tester uh, about uh, federal cybersecurity strategy. Uh, we have the skeleton of our path forward, and we can and should move out and execute on that skeleton. Um, I do think there's also value in continuing to flesh out that skeleton, and in fact, uh, I, I hope that that's, um, the 30-day surge will help us do that. Uh, I'd also uh, thank uh, Senator Carper again for his remarks and, and reiterate uh, the importance of, of information sharing legislation um, and also uh, positive authorization for the Einstein program. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Inspector General McFarland. Yes, I'd like to go back to Senator Sass's uh, uh, recent comment and, and suggest that, uh, that we work very hard to centralize the governance of information technology whenever and wherever possible. Thank you, Inspector General. Again, thank you for your service. Thank you for your independence. Uh, you. I want to thank all the witnesses for the time you've spent uh, for your thoughtful testimony and, and, your question, and your answers to our questions. The hearing record will remain open for 15 days until July 10th at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions for the record. This hearing is adjourned.